millions of us love watching the world's wildlife behaving in strange and wonderful ways. But what lies at the heart of these extraordinary behaviors? Can science explain what's really going on? Now the latest research from all around the world is increasing our understanding of animal emotions, relationships, intelligence and communication faster than ever before. We're going to be traveling the world in search of the most surprising and incredible animal stories. Oh, there, 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 there. Wow, yeah, look at them. Using the very latest camera technology, we'll reveal how and why animals do such remarkable things. And we'll meet the scientists. That is a little male. Who dedicate their lives to understanding these extraordinary discoveries. In this episode, we're in Florida to investigate a very unexpected relationship between a dangerous predator and a gentle giant, which is overturning conventional views of these creatures' intelligence. In North America, we're finding out how we may be making one smart city dweller even smarter. In Cambodia, we're testing the intelligence of a surprisingly clever bear. But first, we're heading to Kenya, where the future of an orphaned baby elephant hangs in the balance. For nearly 40 years, the David Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage outside Nairobi has been rearing orphaned elephants in herds so they can be released back into the wild. But can a group of these older orphans show the empathy needed to save a very special baby? This is Endotto. He's just a year old and is one of the latest arrivals at the orphanage. Conservationist Giles Clark is joining head keeper Edwin Lasucci at breakfast time. He knows oh. he wants to get some feed. Do you want to? Hello, beautiful. You can try. I can try. Yeah. Okay, that's such a good boy. That is a serious bottle of milk. How much milk do they get? He gets four pints every three hours. Mm -hmm. I think you're finished, sweetheart. It's finished. Just look how tiny that trunk is. You can is. blow that trunk, and Hello. that's how you get to make friends with them. How do you make friends with them? When you blow down the trunk, they get to identify your scent. Really? You and blow down their trunk? Yeah, if they give it to you. Okay. Mm. I can't just take it. No. <laughs> Sometimes if it's itchy, we assist them to oh. scratch and silent. <laughs> they feel comfortable sometimes. Does that feel good? Is that like having a scratch? Yes, yeah, like having a scratch inside. Ndotto's been looked after at the orphanage for 12 months. His blanket is designed to recreate the warmth he would get if he still had his mum at his side. Just moments after his birth, Ndotto was found alone, confused and barely alive by local villagers who called in the team from the orphanage. Ndotto was the smallest baby they'd ever taken in and they didn't think he'd survive. But he was a fighter, and with their specialist care, he pulled through. A year later, Ndotto is fighting fit, but if he's ever going to make it back into the wild, it's crucial he starts spending quality time with the other orphans. Scientists now know that elephants live in sophisticated social groups. It's thanks to their emotional intelligence that they have such a strong sense of community, a strict hierarchy and intricate ways of communicating. 
In the herd, it's the adult elephants that teach the babies this code of conduct. But there's a problem. Ndotto thinks he's already in a herd, but that herd is made up of the humans that saved his life. This means he now prefers the company of people rather than his own kind. What is he doing, Edwin? He's just playing and enjoying being with us. Just the, having the contact. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Baby elephants, when you squat down, you are a toy to them. So they want to play. They want to play. They want to push around. By pushing around. around. <laughs> yeah. Him coming to push is just sort of fun or play. Okay. He's not like charging you. No, no, he's no. not being naughty. Oh, here we go. <laughs> pushing now? Yeah, he's gonna. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't do it. don't push. That's a serious game. Yeah, yeah. He's seriously strong. I'm trying not to push back. Okay, okay, okay enough. Enough, yeah, thank right you. Enough. You're too strong for us. Yeah. We give up for you. <laughs> Play is an important part of growing up. But Ndotto has no idea that if he doesn't learn the rules of how to behave as an elephant, he risks being shunned by the herd, which could be disastrous. If an elephant is left alone, that elephant can easily be stressed to death by loneliness. You really think an elephant can die of loneliness? Yes, I have seen it happen. They almost like give up the world to give live. Give up the world to live because they think they're all by themselves. They don't have anyone with them and they just die from a heart broken. Ondoto cannot survive by himself. He needs the company of all the others. Edwin and the team are hoping that a group of older orphans will come to Ondoto's rescue, and that thanks to their extraordinary emotional intelligence, they'll be able to understand what he's been through and teach him what he needs to know. Good boy. Tomorrow, Ndotto will have to find the courage to bond with the herd. He'll face that challenge alone, but tonight, Keeper Julius Shivega will sleep here too. Well, I'm gonna say goodnight. Yeah, very sweet, baby. <laughs> High five. It. You can blow, you can blow his trunk. He says goodbye, okay? <laughs> nice keeper, nice friend of ours, okay? Alrighty, thank you so much. Thank you again, Charles. He loves you because you have got a feeling for him. That's good. Don't make me thank cry. Thank you, man. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll be back later in the program to see if the other elephants will show Ndotto the emotional intelligence, empathy, and the encouragement he needs to become part of their herd. 7,000 miles away in Canada, we're on the trail of a smart little animal that scientists think we could be making even smarter. In their natural habitat, raccoons are opportunistic omnivores. These guys can and will eat anything. Many have ditched the countryside and followed their stomachs to come to our cities and get at our food. Experts believe these urban raccoons are becoming more intelligent than their country cousins. So what's making these city dwellers smarter? Raccoons may look adorable, but these cheeky masked bandits are wreaking havoc in our towns and cities. Raiding dustbins, digging up gardens, and even setting up home inside our houses. In Toronto, the raccoon population is flourishing thanks to easy access to our leftovers. Residents are resorting to the bungee cord in an attempt to make their bins raccoon proof. Yet many are still waking up to find them trashed. Zoologist Lucy Cook is with Dr. Suzanne McDonald, who for the last three years has been using night vision cameras to study just how these raccoons are breaking into bins. It's fantastic to see how they're all just figuring it out. They are really smart, aren't they? These urban raccoons are working as a team. The bungee cord just doesn't defeat them. 
they flip the bin and then stretch it to open the lid just wide enough for one lucky raccoon to get inside. The rural animals never did this. Not one animal ever got into the garbage can, ever. Whereas about 80% of the urban animals figured it out. Suzanne devised other tests and the results were the same. The city dwellers always came out top of the class. I think they are street smart. They know how to approach new things and to spend some time to figure them out, whereas the rural ones don't do that. Why would they do that? They don't have to spend time figuring out human objects. Fundamentally, us creating these cities and these new environments is sort of putting a wedge in the species and sort of causing a divide. I think so, and I think, you know, raccoons have been in the Toronto area for a hundred years. So that's plenty of time for evolution to happen, and it would make sense. It would be strange if it didn't happen, that we hadn't created a difference in the raccoons because they've had to live with us. They, they've evolved with us. We keep one-upping each other and the end result is a smart little raccoon. In an attempt to outwit these resourceful raccoons, experts in the Toronto Council have devised a new impenetrable bin, complete with lockable lid to foil these masked raiders. It may be stumping the nocturnal thieves for now, but if Suzanne is right, all it's doing is ensuring that there'll be even smarter raccoons in the future. But a thousand miles away, in NASA in the Bahamas, there's a seriously clever raccoon who's been making headlines. Beneath these sheets is a wild raccoon that's taken its relationship with humans to a whole new level. This is Pumpkin. She is 13 months old and lives with, and often on, Laura Young. Laura's family found Pumpkin with a broken leg after she fell out of a tree. Laura nursed her back to health, and although Pumpkin can return to the wild whenever she wants, she clearly prefers domesticated life with Laura and her dog. Come on, Pumpkin. She loves eggs, mm. any style, anyway. But sunny side up is her favorite because of the yolk. <laughs> yeah. It's becoming clear why Pumpkin prefers living here to the wild. Raccoons are famously intelligent. What's it like sharing your home with such an intelligent animal? Every single day, it's a new adventure. She's always up to something. She's always trying to get into different things. She's always trying to open our doors. Our entire house has to be baby-proofed <laughs> because of her. She's so intelligent and she's always figuring out new little things. Every day is something new. What is she doing now? She's so clever, she's decided she wants to do some reading. Yeah. One of the things that she's taught herself to do is actually pee in the toilet. So she knows how to go up to it, pees, but she hasn't learned how to flush it yet. So we'll, we'll see if that ever happens. <laughs> she's definitely not boring. Not at all. <laughs> Every day, we're running after her. Yeah. It's like having a two-year-old permanently. It's clear to see how stimulating Laura's house is for Pumpkin. She wants to touch and sniff everything which can be a bit scary. And Pumpkin doesn't even need to see what she's pulling apart. Scientists have discovered that a raccoon's paws have more sensory receptors than almost any other mammal. The raccoon's brain is actually shaped to respond to tactile stimulation. So what that means is when they put their hand on something, they can basically see it. Their brain sees it. So it, it has an outline of what the object is in their brain. When you see Pumpkin's phenomenal dexterity combined with her ability to climb, it's understandable why Laura has to tie up or completely remove all of the handles in her kitchen. You wouldn't want this lady around your best crockery. Pumpkin's instincts drive her to investigate everything, including Laura's cupboards. But when there's a human to provide all her catering needs, it's hardly surprising this raccoon is showing little interest in life back in the wild. And just when you thought they couldn't get any smarter, there's another one across the water in Florida. With three million hits on the internet, Roxy the raccoon has become a bit of a social media sensation. What are you doing? Although this behavior may simply look cute, 
What's truly remarkable is this could be evidence of tool use in a raccoon, which we know is only normally associated with the most intelligent animals. She gets a rock and knocks on my door. Roxy, using a stone to bang on the glass to call for her dinner, suggests just how clever this wild animal has become. The behavior of Toronto's raccoons and the antics of Pumpkin and Roxy helps prove that wild animals become more intelligent when they master human environments. We're staying in Florida and heading to Blue Spring on the St. John's River. Every winter it becomes home to several hundred manatees who move into the warm water refuge when the river temperature drops. Manatees, or sea cows as they're also known, are the gentle giants of the marine mammal world. They graze almost exclusively on seagrass and have relatively small brains compared to their massive bodies that can grow to almost four meters. Wayne Hartley has been studying manatees here for 35 years. The manatees come to Blue Spring just to be warm. That river gets down to eight degrees Celsius and that's terrible for them. They look fat, but they don't have blubber like people think of whales. They've got to be here in order to survive. Manatees have poor eyesight, so they rely on their other senses to perceive the world. They not only have incredibly sensitive whiskers, but scientists have discovered that the hairs which cover their whole bodies make them super sensitive to their surroundings. The manatee's closest relative is actually the elephant, a famously intelligent and maternal animal. And like elephants, the females share nursing duties with each other. But another visitor in the creek is a cold-blooded killer, the alligator. And this one is bigger than most. An alligator that stays here grows much bigger, much faster than other alligators because he stays out all winter long, hunting and eating. A fearsome predator and a docile vegetarian in the same waters sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. But the crystal clear water has allowed researchers to capture on film this incredible footage of a manatee nuzzling an alligator's nose and getting no response. In 30 years, manatee expert Dr. Roger Reap has never seen anything like it. This alligator is totally comfortable having this manatee nose it and nudge it and uh, essentially try to, what looks like trying to initiate play. They both seem to be interacting in a way that neither finds threatening at all. The alligator's lack of reaction is totally unexpected. Like most people, I was surprised the alligator didn't strike at the manatee. So what is going on? One theory relates to the water temperature of Blue Spring. Heated by a thermal current, at 22 degrees centigrade, it's warm enough for the manatees over the winter, but not for a cold-blooded reptile. One of the things about this environment is that the water's colder than alligators usually prefer, so they rest a lot. It seems the manatees have used their intelligence to work this out for themselves. They know it's safe to get up close and on occasion rather playful with their deadly neighbors. Play behavior involving alligators is something I would have never thought of until I saw this video. I think what it's telling us is that manatees are very interested in exploring their environment and finding out what's in it. They have curiosity. And so I think it's intelligent behavior by the manatees. The researchers here have observed nearly a dozen examples of these playful encounters. I've seen big adults rolling and playing, rolling over an alligator, and after 20 minutes, the alligator said, I've had enough, went out in the river. Manatees do play. They play with alligators. They play with everything out there. The alligator's just something else in their environment. And they think, hey, what can we use this for? 
Even a baby manatee shows no fear of an alligator almost twice its size. Playfulness and curiosity are demonstrated by the most intelligent animals. And in this remarkable new footage, a manatee appears to be using a tree stump to scratch itself which could be evidence of tool use in manatees, a behavior only known in clever animals. So appearances can be deceptive. I think there's a lesson in here for all of us because we tend to be very impressed by fast-moving creatures such as predators. We're less impressed in terms of what we think cleverness or intelligence entails by a mammal, in this case a manatee, that's slow-moving, those are the animals we kind of consider boring or stupid. But manatees are not, as some people might think, just slow and dim-witted. Rather, there are processes going on that it's up to us to learn to appreciate. From the warm springs of Florida, we're heading 10,000 miles away to Cambodia, where there could be a new brain box on the block. This is a sun bear cub. The sun bear is native to Southeast Asia and is the world's smallest bear. But remarkably, it has a bigger brain relative to its body size than any land carnivore. These little guys don't hibernate like their US cousins. They're always on the go. Over the past 18 years, the Free the Bears Sanctuary in southern Cambodia has rescued almost 200 bears from the illegal wildlife trade. Experts here believe that the sun bear needs to be smarter than the average bear to survive in the Asian rainforest. We're going to put that theory to the test and see how bright they really are. Sanctuary director Nev Broadis is taking biologist Patrick Ai to meet the bears and help test their intelligence. You know, one, the one thing that I immediately notice about the sun bear is that magical looking golden bib. Uh, that's where it gets its name, the sun bear from. It looks like the sun when he stands up. He absolutely adores honey. Is that something that he'd eat naturally in the wild? Yeah, this is a once in a blue moon opportunity to come across a nice big bee's nest full of honey. A 25 centimeter long tongue and massive claws for climbing are a few of the adaptations a sun bear has to help it find food in the rainforest. But above all, they need to be very resourceful. And researchers believe this is why they are so good at solving problems. To see how smart these bears really are, we're going to set them three classic intelligence tests. First up, simple problem solving. Put some honey in that. Right. Nev fills a tube of tough bamboo with honey. It's too far down for a sun bear to reach with its tongue and is hidden by vegetation. Let me just chuck that in there. Ranny. If Rani can work out first where the honey is and then how to get to it, Come on, Rani. she'll show that she can think ahead to imagine the outcome of her actions. It's a mental process that so far has only been seen in apes and some birds. She should be able to smell the honey in there, right? That's right. She'll leave her greens till last. Probably pull those out. Honey's what she's after. Yep, too deep for a tongue. That's one. Whoa! Literally one bite. Rani has cracked the first problem-solving test. She worked out that the smell of honey came from inside the bamboo, and that by using her jaws and claws, she could break it open and reach her tasty prize. But do sun bears have the brains to match their brawn? The second intelligence test centers on something called object permanence, 
which is the ability to understand that an object still exists, even though it can't be seen. For this test, there are three buckets and a banana reward. Five-year-old Fortnum is facing this challenge. Fortnum has to watch under which bucket the banana is hidden, then go and retrieve it. It might sound pretty simple, but scientists have shown that it's only the cleverest animals that will consistently identify the correct bucket. Once they lose sight of it, most animals would behave as if the banana no longer existed. So that he can't simply sniff out his reward, out he comes. All the buckets have been scented with banana. Well, it looks like he's going directly to bucket number one. Surprise! <laughs> ding ding. Do you think that he's actually remembering where it is? Yeah, sure, because he's not sniffing each of the buckets. He clocked which one had the bananas in it, went straight to it. Fortnum gets it right time after time. Bingo. He's done it. We don't have this ability until we're over a year old. And experts believe that the skill has developed in sun bears because of the challenges they face in the forest. I think it's got a lot to do with the environment. Their territory is very large, but they have to remember where fruiting trees are, they have to remember the seasons that the trees will fruit, um, they have to remember where water sources are. So it does require a level of intelligence that perhaps you, you wouldn't find in a different landscape. The final and most demanding test is one that only the most intelligent animals, including great apes and dogs, can pass. And to make it really difficult, this one's for little Alfie, who at just 12 months old, is a long way from being a fully developed sunbear. More tasty banana is put into one end of a tube. The catch is there's a sheet of perspex dividing the tube in half, creating an invisible barrier between Alfie and the treat. Coming in from the right, Alfie must work out that to get to the banana, he can't access it from this side and must go round to the other side to reach the reward. At this point, most animals would continue to reach uselessly for the fruit before giving up entirely. Perfect, look at that, getting his head well in there. Go on. <laughs> He's got it. It's taken well this clever one-year-old just a few minutes to solve a puzzle that baffles nearly every other species that's tried it. So it seems that the sun bear is not just smarter than the average bear, it's also one of the brainiest animals on the planet. New research is also leading us to question long-held beliefs about a very different group of animals. The idea that reptiles aren't particularly smart comes from research carried out in the 60s. But new studies at Lincoln University by Dr. Anna Wilkinson suggests the earlier experiments had overlooked a simple factor. She concluded they were failing the intelligence tests because they were simply too cold to think. Reptiles are cold-blooded, which means that they um, have to use the environment to regulate their temperature. They can't regulate it themselves. If they're from the tropics, they need to be in a tropical environment in order to be able to respond, to move about, to do anything. Anna decided to give reptiles a chance to redeem themselves. Using her pet red-footed tortoise Moses, she heated the room to a balmy 28 degrees centigrade, and she found that he could solve a food-finding test as well as a rat. To check that Moses wasn't a one-off animal mastermind, Anna tested more tortoises, and they all passed with flying colors. 
But Anna isn't just raising the intellectual profile of tortoises. She recently turned her attention to a lizard known as the bearded dragon. What we wanted to do is test whether a totally different species had similar levels of intelligence to the tortoises, because if they did, then it might suggest that it's something which is general to many reptiles. Anna wanted to see if bearded dragons could demonstrate a gold standard of intelligence, learning by imitation rather than trial and error. If we're learning by trial and error, we have to try and do it, we have to fail, we then have to refine what we're doing, and then we need to do that in a manner that then allows us to succeed. However, if we're able to imitate another animal, if we can see that animal doing it successfully and can replicate that behavior, then it's a much, much more efficient way of solving the problem. So Anna set up a simple challenge. She put tantalizing mealworms on the other side of a gate that could only be opened by sliding it across. If the dragons were going to use trial and error to work out how to open the gate, it could take them hours. So Anna wanted to see if showing them a video of another bearded dragon solving the problem would help. Would they copy what they saw? The experiment needs a control subject who is going to get a different version of the video. Meet Tom. What Tom is seeing is the gate sliding open, but he doesn't get to see another bearded dragon doing that. So he knows that the gate opens and that there's food behind, but he doesn't get information about how to do it. Anna then places Tom in the same setup as he's seen in the video. To open the gate, Tom will have to use trial and error. He's certainly fixated on his dinner, but it is on the other side of the sliding gate. For Tom, the task is too much. Although desperate to get to the mealworms, he just can't work out that he needs to stop pushing and start sliding. This could go on for hours. Anna then brings in Oscar, who has shown a video that does reveal the secret of success. What Oscar sees is he sees another bearded dragon opening that gate. And then the question is, can he use that information to open the gate himself? After Oscar watches the movie, Anna brings in the gate and mealworms. An initial bout of headbanging suggests he's forgotten what he's seen in the video. But suddenly, Oscar makes a breakthrough and he's gulping down his grubby reward. He's copied the dragon in the video almost perfectly, using his left foot to slide the gate to the left. For the eight bearded dragons tested in this way, the results were the same. The dragons that didn't see the solution in the video couldn't do it, but the dragons that did were munching mealworms within seconds. Anna has clear evidence that they're solving problems by imitation, and now science is rethinking the extent of reptile intelligence. For a long time, we thought humans were the only species that were able to imitate. Now we know that you can see it in other great apes and some primates, but to actually demonstrate this ability in a reptile was something which people thought could never be done. We're heading back to Cambodia, where another surprisingly smart animal is helping to save lives. A long history of conflict in this country has left it devastated by landmines. Finding these mines has relied upon experts in body armor painstakingly sweeping with metal detectors. But it's estimated that five million deadly devices still litter the countryside. Removing mines is dangerous and expensive. But that's about to change. Patrick Ayi is about to meet a crack detection squad flown in from Tanzania. And these guys are totally unique. They're rats, which are known for their high intelligence and for having a sharper sense of smell than dogs. 
From a few weeks old, these rats have been trained to sniff out TNT, the explosive found in landmines. They're not your common urban rat, but African giant pouched rats. They have successfully detected thousands of mines in Africa. And now Cambodia is hoping to deploy 16 of these extraordinary animals. Patrick is with team leader Thiap Bunthorn, also known as BT, and his trainee. Who do we have here and why is she playing in this giant sandpit? Her name is Layla. We put her in this to train to find the landmines. The team have buried three dummy landmines in this sandbox. Each mine contains a minuscule trace of TNT. That nose is always sniffing, smelling the area, smelling the ground, sniffing the air. Layla's handler, Mark Shakuru, is using a wire attached to her harness to guide her systematically over the entire area. And because of the tape measure from the guide wire, he knows when she is above one of the deactivated mines. Mark's eyes are fixed on Layla as he waits for her to give him the signal. But of course, he doesn't speak rat. When they sense the smell of TNT, she starts putting her nose into the air. Mm -hmm. And then she starts to scratch. When Layla scratches the ground like this, she's indicating that she's found explosives. You hear the sound. So it's scratching on the ground, and we heard that click. When she hears a click from Mark, she knows that she will be rewarded with a peanut or banana. It's thanks to their intelligence that these rats can be trained with food and a click so easily from a young age. Over time, the handlers reduce the TNT concentrations that the rats are exposed to until they can detect a mine buried 30 centimeters under the ground. Isn't it unfair on these rats to be putting them in, in such danger? It's not because uh, they are lighter. They cannot detonate a landmine. Because in order to detonate a landmine, you need at least five kgs. These rodents typically weigh in at around one kilo, which is one of the key reasons why Layla is considered better suited to be a mine detector than a dog. Can we actually see if she's getting this right? Because yeah, you're telling me this, but... I want to actually see if it's, it. if it's true. Yeah, I don't believe it just yet. You haven't got me just yet. <laughs> so let's see if Layla got it right. When a rat indicates a landmine, disposal experts will carefully probe, then dig around the object to reveal it. Oh, wow, look at that. OK, now oh. you see. Mm. Mark knows that the relationship between a rat and its handler could be the difference between life and death. When we go for the operational, in the real minefield, there is no markings over there. No one knows where is a mine. So you have to rely on your, 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 your rat. So you're working as a team. Layla has proved that she can pinpoint TNT in an isolated pit, and she's happy doing it. But in the real world, there will be other smells that can confuse these rats. Mark's colleague, Sharima Vandaline, is putting another African rat through a different stage of training. Because it was raised in Tanzania, this rat needs a crash course in the smells and sounds of Cambodia. This is something completely new. There are new sights, smells. I can smell motorbikes, food, spices. This is vital training to ensure that rats aren't distracted when searching for TNT. Compared to us, these rats have 50 times the number of smell receptors in their nose. So it's understandable that this rat's whiskers have gone into overdrive. As news spreads of the hero rats, many of the locals are seeing what they once saw as vermin in a new light. It's nice, yeah? Yes. But not everyone is ready to get up close and personal with a kilo of rodent. You wanna say hello? Touch it. No? Hey. <laughs> Whilst the kids are inquisitive about the giant rat, the adults may take more convincing.
Finally, it's back to Rat Boot Camp for a well-earned sleep. After 12 months of training, the hero rats are just weeks from active service. Training in a sandpit is one thing, but it's vital the rats are used to working in a training field that more closely resembles the Cambodian countryside, with all the other smells that could distract these super sniffers. To make it more realistic, the team has buried all kinds of things, including discarded metal objects, which you'd typically find in the ground with mines. These objects force a human team with metal detectors to stop and carefully dig each object up, wasting valuable time. But how will the rats cope? So here you've also got other metal fragments. Yes, because we want to confuse the rats. Ah. The first decoy is a tin can. And it's right under her nose. But she's not fooled. Brilliant. But will she locate the dummy mine with a newcomer at the reins? Even with a novice like Patrick in charge, Layla quickly goes to work. She's got that nose in the air. Layla's scratching. That's a landmine. <laughs> hey, well done. Time for a nutty reward. There you go. Yeah, Layla yeah. doesn't miss a single marker in the whole area. It would take these rats about, what, 15, 20 minutes to search an area 200 square meters, whereas it would take a human team five days. Yes. It's so amazing. These hero rats with their astonishing sense of smell have already helped clear 13,000 landmines from Mozambique, rendering the country mine-free. I hope that this tool can assist a lot in Cambodia so the people can get their lands. To get their lives back. Yeah, and their lives better off. Yeah. All because of one small rat. Yes, you are right. Layla and her sniffing bomb squad are now successfully deployed on their first official tour of duty in Cambodia. Finally, back in Kenya, it's a big day for a small elephant. For the past year, baby Ndoto has been cared for by his keepers at the elephant orphanage. But if he's going to survive back in a wild herd, he's going to have to learn how to live with other elephants. Today, we'll see whether the herd of 29 older orphans show a form of emotional intelligence, empathy, when they meet up with him. Will they give him the confidence he needs to leave his human carers and start his journey to become a wild elephant? Baby Ndotto is on his way to meet his new family. Everywhere you look, there's just elephants walking through the bush. Giles Clark is back with them. Undotto's always preferred to spend his time with people. But Keeper Edwin's convinced all that can change. Do we think that the other elephants are really going to be able to teach Ndotto what's needed? Yeah, they, they are out, they will be able to teach him what is needed because they know he's an orphan as well like them. The time has come. The orphans have arrived. For the plan to work, Ndotto will have to be brave enough to move away from his keepers and towards the herd. This is his big chance. The enthusiastic orphans seem keen to take on their new pupil. Unfortunately, Undotto doesn't want to join in. He keeps running off. Things aren't going to plan.
He's always so determined to follow the keepers. Yeah. Edwin and the team are desperate to see Undotto have the physical contact that the other orphans have with each other. That interaction, touching and playing, is very important because they get to learn from one another and socialize with one another. Okay. But despite everyone's efforts, Undotto still wants to spend his time with people. Have time, have, have, have your sweet time, time <laughs> and play together very well. See you later. <laughs> Don't come with me. No. <laughs> okay. After nearly an hour, it looks like there might be a breakthrough. Mbegu is a young female who, like Ndoto, has suffered. She was rescued from angry villagers who had killed her mother in front of her. In a wild herd, female elephants will look out for any youngsters. Mbegu has met Ndoto before. Mbegu has gone directly to Ndoto. Yeah, straight round, straight to him. Maybe she knows he needs reassurance. Amazingly, this time Ndoto stays right where he is. Begu tries to see the trunk, the rest of the body, touching on Doto, just to reassure, just to reconfirm that all is okay. You can see Doto really leaning his head up against her back leg. You know, like sometimes when a human child is with the mother, the, the baby or the human child will want to touch on somewhere on the mother's body. So like that's what Doto is doing. Experts are only beginning to understand how Umbegu is tuned in to what Ndoto is feeling. Do you think that Umbegu somehow knows the trauma that Ndoto has gone through in the past? And that's part of the reason that she feels the need to embrace and, and take care of him. Yes. They will tend to remember everything that happened in their lives. And that's why Umbegu still knows or remembers what happened to her and her mother. And that's why she extends the love to the other orphans who come in, because she knows what they've gone through. Mbegu is showing a level of empathy scientists used to believe only humans were capable of. With Mbegu at his side, by the end of the day, Ndoto is bonding with the other orphans. and he's learning to copy the way she pulls up the tastiest grass roots. Although he does have a little way to go. But Ndoto certainly hasn't lost his love of people. He's making good progress, with Mbegu watching his every move. It's okay. It's okay. It's time to say goodbye to this determined little orphan. It seems that Mbegu can also sense that human emotions are running high. Okay. She gives Giles that all-important sign that she trusts him. With Mbegu's extraordinary ability to understand Ndoto's needs, his journey back to the wild has begun. In this program, we meet the people who, as a result of Africa's poaching crisis, have struck up close bonds with one of the world's most endangered animals. In Costa Rica, we find out why scientists think that these capuchin monkeys have the strongest team spirit in the animal kingdom. In South Africa, we're investigating how vultures, nature's most infamous scavengers, are more vital than vile and are saving lives. Also in the USA, 
we discover how acupuncture is improving a rare pig's relationship problems. But first, we're heading to the rainforests of Thailand, where a clever matchmaking technique is saving one of our most stunning big cats from extinction, the clouded leopard. They were once common in the rainforests of Southeast Asia, but today, as their habitat is disappearing, only a few thousand remain in the wild, and this elusive cat could soon be extinct. The clouded leopard is one of the most difficult cats to breed in captivity. But here at a breeding project in Khao Kiu, a revolutionary matchmaking program is improving the relationships between their captive cats. Project leader Bill Wood is giving big cat expert Giles Clark an opportunity to get close to these stunning creatures. <laughs> they are just so agile, aren't they? Absolutely. They're just amazing. So beautiful. Clouded leopards make this extraordinary noise in exactly the same way as what a tiger does. It's called a chuff or a priestin, and it's their way of greeting and showing affection. Giles's tigers chuff to him as a greeting, but can he chuff back in clouded leopard? <laughs> Hello. They seem to like his chuffing, because this head licking is also a sign of affection. Hey. Just when you pat them, you can feel just how immensely strong they are. And really, these guys are perfectly adapted for a life in the trees. Clouded leopards have one of the longest tails in the cat family, giving them exceptional balance. Short, strong legs mean they have a low center of gravity, and their broad, powerful paws are perfectly suited to climbing. They're tailor-made for the rainforest, but that forest has all but disappeared. If we can't breed it in captivity, there's a real danger we'll lose this majestic species forever. Clouded leopards in captivity are notoriously difficult to breed. Why do you think that's the case? One of the main problems is male aggression to the females. Some cats, like you'll know, tigers, lions, you can often leave them together and eventually they'll breed. Institutions have tried this and they've put clouded leopards together and come back in the next morning, the female's dead. Because they are so elusive, no one has ever witnessed how clouded leopards breed in the wild. In the past, attempts by other breeding programs resulted in serious injury to the females. Bill's team is pioneering a new breeding technique, and it's very simple. Instead of introducing male and female leopards to each other when they are sexually mature adults, Bill plays matchmaker and brings them together as cubs. When we introduce them at such a young age, they get incredibly well bonded together. And as they grow up, there seems to be no real aggression. They love playing together. Because they get on so well, they go on to breed and not have that male aggression problem. This technique of introducing unrelated male and female cubs at a very young age is known as pair bonding. This bond continues into adulthood, reducing the likelihood of aggression and increasing the chances of successful mating. How successful is this technique of having cubs? It's actually incredibly successful. Virtually all the pairs that we've put together have gone on and bred successfully. One of Bill's most effective pairings is Zhao Nai and Maximus. Really appreciating each other's company, clearly. Since they were introduced as cubs, these two have parented no less than three litters. Look at that, I mean, you can see how well that pair get on. Just so affectionate to yeah, one Yeah, 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 Before this centre was set up, very few clouded leopards were born in captivity. This pioneering programme alone has produced 70 cubs. Might get ambushed again. Oh! 
And these cubs have been sent to zoos all over the world to strengthen the gene pool of this vulnerable species. The goal now is to make sure that they stay genetically stable and we have a healthy captive population as a safeguard. So all this hard work is about trying to create a sustainable population. Yeah, I mean, look what's happened to some of the tiger subspecies that are now extinct. Maybe if they'd had a, a core population in captivity, there, there might be a chance of re-releasing the Javan tiger or something like that. But once they're gone... Oh, you know, they're, gone they're gone for gone. good. Yeah. Hello. Where did you come from? Hello. This is the most successful breeding programme for clouded leopard anywhere in the world. This is truly the most amazing cat experience I've ever had. <laughs> With this technique of pair bonding, what was once one of the world's most difficult of breeding programs is now starting to have positive results. And thankfully, the future of this beautiful species is looking a lot brighter. Next, we're traveling 11,000 miles to the forests of Costa Rica to see how extraordinary bond testing rituals between monkeys is amazing the scientific community. These are white-faced capuchins, one of the most successful and most sociable monkey species in this part of Central America. Biologist Kyle Van Atta is part of a research team who studied and logged the behavior of the capuchins here almost continuously for 25 years. Today he's on the trail of a group of monkeys known as the Flake Troop, and Kyle catches the attention of the alpha male, who they've named Quixote. I love aggressive threat Quixote to me. He is threatening us right now. The monkeys are used to the researchers being around, but Quixote is still keen to show them who's boss. And to make his point, he calls in some backup. You see him looking to Madison. That is what we call a head flag. He looked for and looked back at the threat. It's kind of like a call for help. They pick up on each other's actions, and they'll see uh, a threat approaching the group, and they will team up against the threat for, for the greater good of the entire group. And that's the key to their success. Quixote is joined by Madison, and they start overlording, buddying up to intimidate their foes. This two-headed monster will scare off most rivals. So this behavior we're seeing over here is a social coalition. Uh, we've deemed it overlording. We have two monkeys stacking up on top of each other in a totem pole-like position, and they're threatening. They're both showing their fangs. They're trying to look big and scary, and just keep threats and predators away. Kyle and other researchers have spotted this troop acting in an even more extraordinary way. One of the, the biggest findings of this project are the bond testing rituals that we're seeing between individuals. They can include things like a monkey putting its finger in another monkey's eye, maybe up its nose and its mouth. It's crazy, they almost go into like a trance while they do it. We know it takes a certain level of trust and loyalty on the part of the capuchins. This is a dangerous behavior they're engaging in. You know, they have these incredibly sharp long nails that they use in fights with other monkeys. Whenever they saw it, researchers tried to film this mysterious, trance-like behavior. Now they have a theory. They believe these are social rituals invented by the capuchins to reinforce relationships, friendships, and create trust between them. If monkeys can engage in this behavior, it gives them the opportunity to see how they stand socially with this other monkey. It gives them an idea of, will this monkey back me up in a time when I need him? If I'm willing to put myself on the line and accept this dangerous activity from him and he doesn't hurt me, then I know when a real threat comes, he's likely to help me out in that situation. These bond testing rituals haven't been seen in any other animals. After tracking the monkeys for another two hours, Kyle approaches a small clearing and thinks he spots something. It's two other members of the troop, 
Winnie the Pooh and young Jeezy. It looks like they're performing one of the rituals. There's a large social order in Capuchin society. You have a few key central alpha individuals and a lot of lower ranking individuals. The higher ranking individuals need the help of the lower rankers to, to maintain their dominant position. And the lower ranking individuals need the help of the dominant individuals to just survive daily life and to climb the ranks as well. For capuchin monkeys, knowing who you can trust is absolutely essential because they need to work together to find food, to raise each other's babies, and to defend the troop from rival monkeys and predators. The scientists think that the capuchins perform these bond-testing rituals because they have a greater need to test their friendship than most other species. Their friendships and teamwork are critical to their survival, making them one of the most socially cooperative primates on the planet. Next, we're heading to the USA, where at Louisville Zoo in Kentucky, alternative medicine is helping to improve a rare pig's relationship issues. Zoologist Lucy Cook is with curator of mammals, Jane Ann Franklin, to meet the patient who's been suffering from sore knees. <laughs> this is Albus. He's a six-year-old male called Albus, wow. and he is one of the world's Hello. most unusual animals. Albus is a babarusa. Hello, nice to meet you, sir. You really are an extraordinary looking animal. Babarusas are probably the oddest looking pigs on the planet and one of its rarest. They originate from Indonesia, but deforestation and overhunting has decimated the wild population. They are now an endangered species with only 5,000 left in the wild which is why Jane Ann is keen for Albus to breed. Can I hand feed him? I can hand feed you. Oh, oh! Just remember to let go of the peanut. This is the way to uh, Babarusa's heart, hand feeding peanuts. You are extraordinary looking. I don't mean that in a rude way, Albus. I think you're gorgeous. With his liking for peanuts and his plump posture, it's hard not to fall for this peculiar porker. Albus has already stolen my heart. He steals everybody's heart. Jane Ann doesn't just want this toothy stud to wow the crowds. It's essential that he captures the attention of Patrice, the resident female. So he's got an important job to do. He needs to help save his species. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Albus is in the SSP, which is the Species Survival Plan. And so he's an important member of that population and he needed to reproduce. However, two years ago, Jane Ann discovered that Albus was not the fighting fit boar she needed. He had issues with his dainty legs. They've been causing him problems, right? Yes. About a year and a half, two years ago, he started having some issues and we started to investigate and we found that he had a patella that slipped. As in his the kneecap? kneecap. Yes. Yeah. That sounds painful. Yes. The pain was clear to see. Albus was limping badly and it was affecting his chances of breeding. Being able to be up on his hind legs and have some stamina to mount the female was very important. So that was one of the things we were really looking to fix was to be able to allow him to breed and breed comfortably. When you've got an animal like that that's in pain, what do you normally do? We could have corrected it with surgery and that would have been the easiest part. The post-operative care would have been very difficult because he would have had to have stayed off his leg for probably six to eight weeks. Oh. And it would have had to have had a bandage and just managing a wild animal in that situation, it just didn't seem like a viable way for us to go. So we looked into alternatives. They turned surprisingly to acupuncture. Dr. Carrie McManus, a local vet, had successfully used it on other animals that were suffering from inflamed joints and arthritis and was convinced this alternative treatment could help Albus. Needles are carefully placed into the skin where it's thought they trigger a tiny response that relieves pain and stimulates the healing process. Carrie's been treating Albus every fortnight for the last 11 months, and today is his latest session. Stacy, if you would let Albus in. Albus! He clearly trusts Carrie, in spite of her needles, because he takes no time to assume the position. Good boy. 
when Carrie inserts the first needle into Albus, he becomes motionless. So I just insert it a little bit, and then we kind of push the needle in just a little bit more. Once it's seated, what we call needle grab, then I'll twist it both directions, which allows the underlying cells to grab the needle. This has got to be one of the most peculiar things I have ever seen. <laughs> it's like he's aware that something's happening, but it doesn't look like he's, he's in any kind of pain. He gets this kind of quiet, still look in his eyes, and... He seems to be happy. Carrie doesn't just treat Albus as a piggy pincushion. She knows precisely where to put each needle. So I basically did a lot of research online trying to map out his anatomy and physiology of where vessels run, nerves run, how his muscles actually go, so that I could actually adjust the acupuncture points to best fit his anatomy. Albus has just made a smell. Yes, he has. a yeah. lot of these back points will also stimulate not only treating muscle pain, but they will stimulate his colon and large intestinal tract. Ooh. Albus shift. When the treatment is over, Albus emerges seemingly pain-free. The ultimate proof that Carrie's acupuncture was working recently came into the world. Want a peanut? Her name is Babs. probably wouldn't be here if Albus hadn't had the acupuncture. The future of the captive Babarusa population is looking very healthy, if not a little mischievous. How does it make you feel to see them here today? It's awesome. It's very rewarding. It's, it's a highlight of my career to have these guys here and to be able to share them with everybody and to be able to show them off, so to speak. What would you say to people who are skeptical about acupuncture? Don't knock it till you try it. Albus doesn't know that it's acupuncture, and it works for him, so. And he's not the only one. Carrie is also using acupuncture to treat animals of all sizes, from an Indian elephant to a pygmy goat. Eight thousand five hundred miles away in South Africa, scientists have discovered a very unexpected relationship between two very different animals. Remote cameras at Shushluwe Umfolosi Park in KwaZulu Natal have captured footage that's not just amazing researchers at the park, but the online community all over the world. The internet went wild. Our website crashed. Uh, we got so many views and so many comments on it. A research camera in the park had captured images of a cat-like predator called a genet appearing to ride on the back of a rhino and a buffalo. This genet has been such an internet sensation. We have nicknamed it Janet Jackson. Wow. That yeah. was those new cameras. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. the new site. We should try and the first to spot Janet Jackson's antics, researchers Taryn Gilroy and Dave Druce have been trying to work out what's behind this strange relationship. The Janet's bizarre behavior goes against everything we know about these animals. Janets are nocturnal, and although they resemble cats, actually belong to a separate group of carnivorous mammals. They're timid and solitary, and wouldn't normally be seen near buffaloes and rhinos. A small predator like the genet always try to avoid conflict and bumping into other animals that can injure them or squash them. So you would think that they would try and avoid each other. For example, if a rhino was coming down a path and the genet was on the path, the genet would just get out the way as quickly as possible. Very strange that they're even together. What's more, by studying their different markings, the team have realized that at least three genets have been recorded behaving in this way. The clarity is amazing. Determined to find out more, Dave and Taryn set up additional cameras and finally managed to capture the genets' acrobatics on video. Once again, in the middle of the night, a genet had hitched a ride on a rhino. Yes. <laughs> Just holding on. It's amazing. The video held vital clues about what the genet is doing. And it's rather ingenious. 
I'd probably go for the theory that it's catching something as it's coming past the rhino. This genet leans down and appears to grab an insect. The rhino is disturbed that the genet has just gone down and caught with its mouth. As the rhino eats from the bush, it flushes out insects that the genet swoops down and catches. Then the rhino gets a fright from the still camera that flashed. And all the while, the genet holding onto the back of the rhino into the darkness. The genet seemed to have worked out that riding on the back of larger animals was a brilliant new way for grabbing a meal. Animals don't do things without a reason. I think the genets figured out this isn't a good way of getting food every now and again, and it's just exploiting that. These images show a highly unusual example of an animal taking advantage of, but not harming another. Dave and Taryn are now installing more cameras to see how many other genets are doing this, establishing just how widespread this intriguing and previously unknown relationship is. We're staying in South Africa to find out how an animal we associate with death could be saving lives. Vultures are the most notorious of scavengers. They're one of very few animals to feed on the carcasses of the dead. And this is why scientists think they play a crucial role in the environment, a role that is protecting us from disease. Kerry Volta from South Africa's largest vulture sanctuary and research center is taking biologist Patrick Ie to meet a very special tame vulture. You're going to meet PJ, which stands for Percy Junior. Percy Junior. Percy Junior. Right. Two-year-old PJ broke one of his wings when he was just a baby. He'll never be able to fly, so has become a permanent resident here at the sanctuary. Sitting on his own. Ah. <laughs> yeah, he looks <laughs> looks quite big up close in person. Wow. A little daunting. Is, yeah, daunting. <laughs> I'm just very aware of his presence. This is quite intimidating. He probably can sense that, <laughs> <laughs> which is not a good thing. <laughs> So if you want to, and if you're brave enough, you can close off first. Okay. Okay. Wow. And if he wants to, just pull away from you. You know, if it gets too hard, you just oh, pull away. Getting, getting nipped by a vulture. <laughs> if you want, you can take your cap off and hold it, hold it. And that's it. That <laughs> and then he'll try and put his head into your cap. Yes, look. He's pressing around, look. <laughs> So that's very much like what they would do in a car. It's really interesting, look. Everything about PJ's anatomy makes him the perfect scavenger. His bald neck and head aren't a fashion statement, but help him stay clean as he digs into a carcass. His large beak is uniquely shaped. You can see how he uses the tip of his yeah. beak. It to is rip just things. like a hook. It's just the tip there. And that was for hooking onto flesh and yanking it. And even his tongue is specially adapted for the task at hand. The tongue has razor sharp edges, almost like sandpaper, and it strips the bone. Nothing about these birds has been left to chance, even down to their strangely flat feet. The reason why they're flat is they're not predatory at all. They're 100% scavengers. So their feet are only good for putting their full weight on the carcass so they can actually rip it open. Vultures cannot kill at all. Surely they can kill small rodents or, you know, they can't kill at all. No, they're, they're, they don't have that um, ability to. But it's the way a vulture consumes its food that's most interesting to carry, making us rethink how important our relationship is with them. And the best way of seeing this is to invite 200 vultures to lunch. Kerry and Patrick are in the center's viewing hide. On today's menu, a carcass of cow that's died from natural causes. Donated by a local farmer, it's been rigged with cameras. The idea is to lure in wild vultures 
and watch them feed. We can see them circling. It's taken just an hour for the vultures to begin to gather. How do they find th this food? Vultures have incredible good eyesight. They can see about six kilometers away from them. You'll have, for example, the vulture in the front, and he'll be thermaling and he'll find the site. That triggers a vulture behind him to go, oh, hang on, that must be something where that vulture is. After circling for 30 minutes, the first vulture lands, and it soon has backup. But nothing happens. For me, that's really surprising. I thought that, you know, as soon as there's a dead carcass or an animal that even looks like it's on the way out, that the vultures would be circling and just, yeah. you know, maybe coming down and pecking them whilst they're still alive. But that's not the case at all. No, it's what Disney likes us to believe. <laughs> but it's not the case at all. They're going to make sure it's really dead and it's kind of past dead. Surprisingly, it's another hour before one vulture tentatively makes its move. Ah, one just landed straight on top. Is there some sort of order in terms of which vulture comes in first? It's normally a female. Females are by far more dominant than males. She basically wants to just dominate the entire area. OK, now they're all coming in. Yeah. Look how many of them are. That is just incredible. Wow. The images from the cameras give a unique vulture's eye view of what's happening. You can see how they're using those beaks so effectively. Harry, this is the first time you've seen how they feed from this angle. It's spectacular. It's amazing. And you can see with the long legs how they're adapt to really dig inside there. You see how they're using their, just their weight to kind of push themselves and kind of lean against the carcass. Mm. Our camera's getting completely swamped. Oh, <laughs> there, oh. there we go. The camera's... Um, Surprisingly, Kerry's research has shown vultures are vital to our health. Because unlike other animals, when vultures consume meat contaminated with infections like rabies, cholera and anthrax, once eaten, the diseases are completely eradicated. And it's all thanks to the strength of the acid in their stomachs. Well, we've got this acid here, so why don't we actually put that to the test? So if you grab those glasses, okay. I'll grab these ones. Just pop these gloves on. Hydrochloric acid closely matches a vulture's stomach acid. To see just how corrosive it is, Kerry's going to drop in a piece of metal. Let's see what happens. All righty. Ready? Go for it. Bubbling a little bit. That is... Wow! Look at that! That is... <laughs> a very strong reaction. If we replace the hydrochloric acid with actual vulture stomach acid, we'd see the exact same reaction. Yeah. You're looking at a vulture stomach that's a hundred times more acidic than what a human stomach is. So you can really see the power of that inaction right here. Yeah, and what we need to remember as well is, you know, that breaks down diseases, any kind of bacteria, absolutely no issues for a vulture. That is incredible. It's taken just one hour for the vultures to strip the entire carcass, along with any diseases that may have been present. This is a completely different scene yeah. to how we left it. Yeah. Exactly. And do you also notice the smell's gone? You're right. I can't really smell anything at all, really. I am I'm genuinely gobsmacked. When we left this carcass here, it was smelling, it was, the belly was bloated, and all the organs, all the meat has been pecked right off those bones. 
the vultures have not only eaten the virulent strains of bacteria, they've also processed and completely eradicated them from the ecosystem. And this is why we need to change our attitude towards them. They're seen as the undertakers, and, and people don't actually understand their importance. The implications of losing the species is very real, and the effect of that is catastrophic for me, for you, for anyone, really. Without vultures, the spread of fatal diseases to humans increases. When India's vulture population plummeted by 99% over a 10-year period, scientists found the result was over 50,000 extra human deaths from rabies. Which brings home how important it is to rethink our relationship with this life-saving species. Just off the south coast of Victoria in Australia is Middle Island. It's uninhabited, but every summer it plays host to a visiting colony of pint-sized guests. To avoid predators, they return to the island each night under the cover of darkness. And by morning, you wouldn't know they were here at all. Let's see if there's anyone home. This is the little penguin, the world's smallest, averaging 30 centimetres tall. Yes, we've got an adult. John Sutherland and Melanie Wells are part of a volunteer group that monitors Middle Island's population. This one's already microchipped. Hidden safely in underground burrows, the colony is currently doing well. 13.2. Right here. But that wasn't always the case. A few years ago, a nocturnal predator arrived on Middle Island. Trapped in their burrows, exposed on the beach, the little penguins never stood a chance. It wasn't a very pretty sight. There were just dead penguins everywhere, all over the island. I'm talking a hundred penguins. The penguins were used to threats from the sea or the sky, but this predator was different. It came from the land. There were foxes on the mainland that worked out how to get to the island. They learnt how to swim. One of the females even taught her pups to swim out here. Night after night, red foxes swam across, eating a few, but slaughtering hundreds. Soon, just four penguins out of 300 remained. Pretty much wiped, wiped out the colony. The situation was bleak. How do you save a penguin colony from the brink of total eradication? Local government, scientists and conservationists had no answer. They needed a chicken farmer. Hey, fear some mongrels. Local farmer Swampy Marsh keeps his chickens safe from foxes using an Italian sheepdog breed known as the Maremma. What the bad dogs you are, yes. Maremmas were bred to protect and live among livestock, and they have been doing this for hundreds of years. Because they are territorial, they will protect any animal that lives on their patch. In Swampy's case, his chickens. They will chase away anything perceived as a threat. Their senses are amazing. I've sat here with a spotlight and I can't see the fox, but they know exactly where it is. It's almost like they've got infrared vision. Following the massacre on Middle Island, Swampy made an extraordinary proposal. Use these dogs to guard the remaining penguins. The government thought he was mad. I knew they'd do it. As far as they're concerned, penguins are just chooks in dinner suits. Uh, it's no big deal. Maremmas have been patrolling Middle Island ever since. Eight-year-old sisters, Yudi and Tula, are the current penguin guardians. They stay on the island at night, and in the morning, Phil Root, their dedicated handler, comes to check on them. 
I'll come out here each day, bring the dogs some fresh water, bring them some food, feed them and water them while I'm out here. A bit of grooming, and then I'll take the dogs for a walk around the island to let the scent of these dogs in the air to keep the foxes away. Yudi and Tula were introduced to the penguins as puppies, forming a unique social bond with the birds and an instinctive link with their habitat. These girls just protect the space they're in, protect their flock, protect their home. As night falls, the little penguins come ashore with a belly full of fish for their chicks. Yudi and Tula are guarding their flock from invaders. The project has been more successful than anyone dreamed. There hasn't been a single fox sighting on Middle Island since the dogs were introduced. The colony was one fox attack away from total extinction. Today, numbers are back up to 130. Thanks to the astonishing relationship between the Maremmas and the penguins. Man's best friend has become the penguin's great protector. Next, we're in Kenya to meet Zachariah Muta, who for the last six years has been looking after an extremely important elderly rhino. Sudan is the only male northern white rhino left on Earth. With a maximum lifespan of 50 years, at 42, he's the equivalent of an 80-year-old man. I feel very close to Sudan. He's my closest friend. We don't want him to get extinct. So I really take very great care of him. All the world's five species of rhinos are under threat from poachers, but none more so than the northern white. They are completely extinct in the wild. There are now only three left in captivity. Sudan and two females. These last survivors are highly protected at the old Pajeta Conservancy in Kenya. On the black market, rhino horn is now more valuable than diamonds. So the trio are under 24-hour armed guard. This is Sudan. Conservationist Giles Clark has come to meet Zachariah in Sudan. He's the last of his kind. Must feel like an awful lot of responsibility taking care of Sudan. We really love him very much, so we really take care of him just like elderly people. Wild male rhinos can be aggressive, but Sudan is used to his human protectors and is approachable when Zachariah is nearby. He knows you very well. Yeah, rhinos, they have got very good sense of smell and hearing, so they can recognize a keeper as a newcomer. Okay. Yeah. So, so he he's... knows the difference between us? Yes. He's not quite sure of me yet, but you're definitely mm. a friend. Yes. That's what makes me feel happy to be so close to Sudan. The phrase, last chance to see, is often overused. But in this case, it could be true. Sudan spent most of his life in a Czech Republic zoo. He was part of a captive breeding program, including the two females, Najin and Fatu. After nine years of failed breeding attempts, in an ambitious last-ditch effort, they were airlifted to Africa and returned to their natural habitat in the hope they would reproduce. <laughs> Richard Vine is CEO of the Conservancy. For all of them, their condition improved sort of almost overnight. So their, their, their toenails got better and, and, and stopped cracking and their skin condition looked better. So it was obviously something that suited them about coming back to Africa. Sudan, the only one of the trio to have been born in the wild, had a new lease of life among the other rhinos in the reserve. He established a territory, he fought with other males in the area when he first came here. He's acted as a territorial male and he's mated, but he's never successfully got females pregnant. Over the next six years, hopes that Sudan could help save his kind began to fade. As he got older, the young females began to bully him. So Sudan was moved into a retirement paddock on his own, where he now depends on Zachariah and his team for everything. 
He's going blind in one eye. He's struggling to walk. So his relationship with people like, like Zach um, and other keepers um, is, is fundamentally important for his welfare. He's old, he relies upon them uh, for his food and for, for company. It's enormously important. Despite his ailments, Sudan is not in pain and has all the food, comfort, love and support an old man needs in his final years. I better die first before Sudan. Yeah, because I don't want to lose him. I'll feel so sad, I'll feel so sad. It's completely obvious just what a close bond Zach and Sudan have. Sudan's welfare and his psychological needs are being met by this special friendship. Tragically, at 42, Sudan's breeding days are now over. As things stand, he will be the last male northern white rhino to walk on Earth. It's so amazing but so sad because he's too old enough, but we still had hope that he, he can still exist. He looks very healthy, he's in good condition, so he might live after 50. However long Sudan has left, it's obvious that this gentle giant could not be more loved. He's a good boy. Wow, look at the size of that mouth. It's amazing to be this close. Such a handsome boy. You have no idea just how significant you are. However, there is a glimmer of hope. These rhinos are the focus of pioneering scientific endeavor, which has been used successfully with a giant panda. Existing frozen northern white rhino sperm could still be used to save the species. But the clock is ticking. Rhinos have existed for 40 million years, but it's only in the last 100 years that we have been responsible for their tragic demise. Two thousand miles away, in a secret location in South Africa, there is some encouraging news about our relationship with the southern white rhino. This is Ike. He was left for dead after poachers attacked him and removed his horn. Vet Herat Steenkamp was first on the scene. It's quite obvious that he was a fighter. He wanted to live. And just like in humans, I think that makes a huge difference. If you have a patient that is that is willing to fight. Since then, Herat and his team of vets have struck up a remarkable relationship with Ike. The biggest challenge was making sure Ike's wound did not get infected and healed as soon as possible. So they needed a really heavy duty dressing that would stay on the end of a rhino's face. Eight days ago, Herat sedated Ike and attached a state-of-the-art fiberglass dressing to his wound. Biologist Patrick Ayi has joined ranger Steve Dell to try and get a close look at the patient. He's a wild animal, so they have to be careful. As they enter the enclosure, Ike is on the far side. Any fears that Steve had that Ike was not on the mend quickly disappear as Ike's two and a half ton bulk stirs from his slumbers. We are going to go out. Steve is concerned about their safety, and they make a rapid exit to the other side of the fence. Ike certainly seems to have recovered well. OK, you coming to say hello, my boy? He's a good boy. Easy, my boy. Look how magnificent he is. He's huge. Yeah. He's coming, he's coming. They get a good look at Herat's handiwork. You can see it's fraying a little bit, but it's still on, which is a good sign. The longer it stays on, the better, I'm sure, in terms of the healing process. He is going to be a survivor, for sure. The dedication of Herat and his team has paid off. 
but tragically, Ike is unlikely to be their last patient. The rhino poaching crisis has reached a tipping point. Now, for the first time, more rhinos are being killed than are being born. These are three of the most recent casualties, PJ, Lizzie, and Monty. They're all orphans, but thanks to Amy Coy, they still have a chance. It's heartbreaking and it makes me angry that we can't protect the animals, that we cannot stop a young rhino from losing its mother. It's terrible. It makes you angry and it makes you sad at the same time. I get very emotional. Amy's plan is to raise them at her farm until they are old enough to go to a reserve where they will get the protection they need. In the meantime, they seem pretty happy with their lot. PJ, Monty, come! Come! Come, you want milk? Come! Come, let's go get milk! Come! <laughs> Boys, come! Come! Baby rhinos use this high-pitched squeak to communicate with their mum and they don't hesitate to let their human mum know when they are peckish. The babies here drink 15 litres of milk twice a day. Patrick's feeding four-month-old Lizzie. And do I have to squeeze it as, as she's suckling? No, she'll suck, she'll suck all by herself, yeah. Wow. You are a hungry girl, aren't you? It's remarkable to think that this whole poaching crisis comes down to this right here. The rhino horn is made out of keratin, the same material that horses' hooves are made out of, and even our fingernails. So really, it is worthless. There is no doubt that we are responsible for the plight of this majestic animal. Thanks to Zachariah, Herat and Amy, there are at least some rhinos that are safe for now. If we can save this iconic species, then there may be hope for the many other endangered animals with which we share the planet. In this show, we're in the woodlands of northwest Austria, where scientists are interpreting the howl of the wolf and asking if they really deserve their big, bad reputation. We discover the communication skills required to persuade a penguin raised by people to swim. And in Australia, we meet the conservationists using cutting-edge communication technology to try and save an iconic endangered species. But first, we're in Limpopo, South Africa's most northern province. Here, an incredible love story is unfolding between two very different lions. Zukara, who lives here at the Sao Conservancy, and Cleopatra, who used to live on the other side of the fence. Now they're going to meet face to face for the very first time. A week ago, ecologist Jason Turner organized for Cleopatra to be transferred into the reserve after years of extraordinary behavior from the nine-year-old lioness. She was obsessed with wanting to join the pride of lions on, on this side. So, she was at the fence line every day. She swam across a river, climbed under an electric fence in order to bond with our male. The male who had caught Cleopatra's attention wasn't just any lion. It was Zukara, one of just 12 white lions left in the wild. A very rare change in their DNA causes their splendid color. And it sadly meant that white lions have been hunted almost to extinction. 
For five years, Cleopatra had appeared every day at the fence of Zakara's reserve, obsessively waiting to see him. Lionesses generally mate with a male who's the head of their own pride, normally a big, dark-maned male. Jason, who has worked with lions for 20 years, has never seen a lioness go to such lengths to communicate her feelings for a male who was completely out of her reach. This obsessive behavior, going up and down the fence line, putting on seductive moves like you've never seen, lots of tail swishing, the lionesses will roll over, they've got this white, sort of very sexy belly that they flash at the males. Lionesses are arch seducers. I mean, seduction was invented by lionesses. Today, we're hoping to see some unique lion behavior. Zuccara and Cleopatra are going to meet face to face for the very first time. Lion introductions can be extremely unpredictable. So Zuccara has been kept away from her in a separate enclosure to allow Cleopatra to get used to her new surroundings and bond with resident lioness Swalu. Now the team are opening the gate to release Zuccara back into the 4,000 acre reserve. Biologist Patrick Ayi has joined Jason to see if Zuccara picks up Cleopatra's scent. We found Zuccara. Listen to that. So you can see he hasn't wasted any time. He's doing what we expected him to do, and that's the natural male response. He's picking up the chemical signals, the pheromones, from where Cleopatra scent marked. And uh, that grimace, what he's doing is, it's called flemin. And he's picking up the scent so he knows that she's here. He knows that she's here. And he's, it looks to me like he's figuring out which way she's gone. Scent markings aren't the only way lions communicate with each other. On the other side of the reserve, the lionesses are on the move. Cleopatra's out in front, picking up Zuccara's calls. This communication is a good sign. But this is a love story that could end in tears. Like all lions, Zuccara and Cleopatra are powerful creatures. Males in particular can be extremely aggressive to outsiders. So even lion expert Jason doesn't know exactly what's going to happen when Zuccara and Cleopatra meet. Lions are very fiery animals. They can be very aggressive, of course, they're fierce hunters, predators, and the males are incredibly territorial. So bringing two adult lions together, there's always going to be fireworks. Lionesses often have to work together to defend themselves from other lions. And Jason is hoping that resident female Swalu will help Cleopatra if things turn nasty with Zakara. As the sun sets, it looks like Zakara and Cleopatra could meet at night. It's vital the team witness this first encounter, because how they interact will show if they have a future together. So the team are going to try to stick with Zakara throughout the night. Okay. Got full signal on Zakara. A full signal from Zakara's radio collar means he's within 10 meters of the truck. Here he comes, here he comes. It seems he's definitely on the move and on the hunt for Cleopatra.
Lions have their own distinctive roars, as unique as our fingertips. And there's no doubt Cleopatra will be hearing these calls. An hour later, Zakara appears by the fence, and he's not alone. Oh, my goodness. Just in front of him are Swalu and Cleopatra. After five years, Zakara and Cleopatra are finally face to face. Swalu hangs back. They're so tentative. Amazing set. He came in for them almost, but they both instantly were like, no, don't try and mess with us at all. <laughs> we mean business. Their encounter ends with a final scent spray from Zakara. It's one of many signs that he's receptive to Cleopatra's presence. Never seen anything quite like it. That was really exciting. I'm still pretty, pretty shaky. I mean, it happened all within a split of a second, and you got these two strong, powerful lions, Cleopatra and Zakara, but no one was doing any damage, it seemed. Exactly. Uh, heated engagement, but you could see more bark than bite. No excessive use of violence, really. More just um, demanding respect from each other. Their non-aggressive calls and lack of violence are signs that as first dates go, this has been a roaring success. Zakara made a beeline for Cleopatra, and in a dramatic act of loyalty, Swalu rushed in to back her up. Together, they stood their ground, with Zakara adopting a position behind the bush, which shows his respect for newcomer Cleopatra. These are all positive signs for a future relationship between them. This is exactly what you've been waiting for for five years. I'm, I mean, I'm ecstatic. Uh, I mean, bungee jumping's got nothing in terms of the adrenaline that I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling that, it too, that's Those for sounds sure. were just phenomenal. After just a week and no longer separated by a fence, Zakara and Cleopatra are spending most of their time together. Their phenomenal story has given us new insight into the lengths a lioness will go to to communicate with the male she wants. Back in the UK, Birdland in Gloucestershire is home to Britain's only breeding programme for endangered king penguins. Here, one man has been on an extraordinary mission to try and teach a penguin how to swim. <laughs> Hello. Zoologist Lucy nice Cook is joining head Hello. keeper Hello. Alistair Keane with very special penguin Charlotte. Our 14-month-old um, king penguin. Hello, Charlotte. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Charlotte had an unusual start in life. She was laid as an egg last year by Frank and Lily. Um, and within 24 hours, Frank had dropped and broken the egg. So we had to take the egg away and repair it with a little bit of super glue. Um, wow, you can do it, that? Yeah. You can repair an egg with super glue? Yeah, as long as it's not too big a crack. If penguin parents drop an egg, they tend to abandon it. So Charlotte became Alistair's responsibility. 
I like to talk to the egg because the parents would call to the chick. Do you talk to it in a human voice or in a penguin? I just talk to it as, as I normally would, like I'm talking to you now, so I sort of keep going chick, I'll see you soon and things like that. Aww. Sounds really silly, I know. When birds hatch from their egg, they form an immediate bond with the first living creature they see. It's known as imprinting. The first thing Charlotte saw wasn't her mum, it was Alistair. As far as she's concerned, I'm mum and dad. She's got to give me grandchildren, so to speak, in the next few years. By six months, Charlotte was fully grown with a thick coat of brown downy feathers, perfectly adapted to keep her warm as she developed. <laughs> That's Three her months. begging for you, isn't yeah. it? She's going, Dad, feed me, come feed and, me. Come and give me some more food. And like any typical king penguin chick, at 12 months, Charlotte's coat molted and she started to transform into the stunning adult she is today. All right, Charlotte. So I think you're getting five stars as a penguin parent, from what I can see. Yeah, we got so far so good. And then we hit a snag in the fact that she just would not go in the pool. Oh no, but she's a penguin. I know, that's, but everyone would think they'd take to it really easily, but she was having none of it. She'd watch everyone else go in for a swim. She would not go in. Despite Alistair's best efforts, Charlotte could not be coaxed into the water. <laughs> What was going on? In the wild, it's very important that king penguin chicks avoid water while they're still wearing their brown coat of baby feathers. It's warm, but it's not waterproof. So if it gets wet in the icy waters of the Antarctic, the chicks can drown or die of hypothermia. Only when they get their waterproof adult plumage do they pluck up the courage to take the plunge. What surprised Alistair was that although Charlotte's body was fully equipped to swim, her mind was clearly saying no. Perhaps penguin expert Professor Rory Wilson can shed light on Charlotte's strange behaviour. Rory, are you surprised by Charlotte's fear of water? A bit surprised, but not hugely. Um, it's a big deal if you're a penguin, from being a woolly, fluffy thing that lives on land. And there's this terrible transition period where you have to do it. It's like bungee jumping. So I think there's a lot of fear there. So what do the parents do in, in terms of encouraging them into the water? They're brutal. It's tough love and it's do or die. The king penguin chicks, they actually go through the whole winter starving. They'll get the odd meal from their parents. They'll go down to about seven kilograms, really, really thin and miserable. It's hunger that drives young penguins to overcome their fears and into the sea to catch fish. But Alistair wasn't prepared to take this tough love approach with Charlotte. He'd have to find another way to get her to swim. First thing we try to do is push her in and she jumped straight back out, had none of that. No matter how hard he tried, it became clear that gentle persuasion wasn't going to work. Alistair had to resort to more dramatic methods. We've got a rock in the middle of the pool. I took her and sat her on the rock, so she had to get wet to get back out. After hours of intense encouragement, Charlotte decided to take control of her fear. It's the only time I've ever seen a king penguin with both feet off the ground. She went in feet first, almost a cannonball. Alistair and Charlotte had cracked it. And once she was in the water, Charlotte's instinct to swim kicked in. Four months later on, thanks to Alistair's coaching, Charlotte loves nothing more than a dip in the pool. She's getting very good now. She's the first one in there most days, last one out. You're a proud dad. Proud dad, yeah.
In the woodlands of northwest Austria, one animal's spine tingling howl has landed it with a big, bad reputation. Here, groundbreaking research into how wolves communicate is revealing that they might actually be more loyal, tolerant, and friendly than we ever imagined. The Wolf Science Center is home to 12 timber wolves, the largest of all wolves. In the wild, they're specialized pack hunters of bison, moose, and elk. Here, in order to make them tolerant of people, they're hand reared for the first five months of their lives before becoming part of a pack. This allows the team to study their behavior up close. It's long been thought that the pack is held together by an aggressive alpha male, and the only loyalties the other members have are to him. But when researchers Dr. Simon Townsend and Kurt Conchal removed different members from the group, they began to think that there was more going on within the pack dynamic. We're coming. So today we will remove Aragorn, and then we're going to look at the behavior of all the other wolves remaining in the pack. Whenever they separated a wolf, Oops. in this case second in command Aragorn, the rest of the pack would have an extraordinary reaction. Scientists believe the wolves are trying to call back their missing pack member. Their howls can be heard more than four miles away, and wolves can recognize the individual calls of their pack. Simon analyzed the howls using what's known as a spectrogram. You can see there's two howls, a shorter one and a longer one, and you can see how the how changes over time. What this can tell us by taking measurements is we can work out what kind of information is encoded in the howls and also how often specific wolves are howling and how long their howls are. By repeating the test many times, he discovered something surprising. Different wolves would howl longer and louder for certain individuals. It looked as if within the pack, it wasn't all about the alpha male. The wolves each had their own particular best friends. This new study is changing our perception of how the pack works. The scientists here are so convinced that we've misunderstood wolves that Dr. Frederica Ranga has devised another experiment that looks at a different form of wolf communication, their body language. Frederica believes that because wolves have to hunt together to bring down big prey, there are more tolerant species than their closest relatives, domesticated dogs. So we basically put a bowl of food in between two animals and then we see who's eating and who's not. And this is really about testing tolerance, so whether the animals share food with each other or not. First up, it's the dogs. Will Meru share his food with junior pack member Hiari? Open, open! Both dogs rushed for the bowl, but Hiari doesn't get any food. And he seems to know that he shouldn't get any closer to Meru while he eats. The other one doesn't even dare to get close to the food. Not only does Meru refuse to share, but the hierarchy between the two is so ingrained, Hiari knows not even to try to challenge him. OK. Every time we run the test, underdog Hiari is left with nothing. He just gets to lick the empty plate. Man's best friend, not quite as tolerant as we thought. 
How will the wolves fare? We've got Casper, the alpha male, and junior pack member Shima. If the old assumptions about wolves are true, alpha male Casper will eat all the food, and Shima will be left with nothing. Remarkably, the wolves behave in a completely unexpected way. So basically what we see here is that they do share, there's a bit of grumbling in between, but the other one just ignores it. Unlike the dogs, even though Casper is the dominant male, he tolerates sharing with Shima. It's really that they do communicate with each other and even if the lower ranking animals say if they don't like something and they have the right to say it. This ability to share and communicate is further proof that the wolf pack is much friendlier and less hierarchical than we previously thought. Scientists believe that as dogs became domesticated, they learned to scavenge for food as individuals. But wolves have always had to hunt together to bring down big prey. They've had to be tolerant, communicative and friendly to survive. Ten thousand miles away on the other side of the planet, in the eucalyptus forests of Queensland, Australia, conservationists are harnessing the power of communications technology originally designed for the military. They're trying to save an iconic species that us humans are putting under huge pressure. The koala. Deforestation isn't just wiping out animals in remote places like the Amazon. It's also happening in towns and cities, like this one, Brisbane. Conservationist Giles Clark is meeting a recent victim of the rapid urban expansion here in Queensland, where the koala population has plummeted by 40%. You can really feel how sharp those claws are. There you go, mate. <laughs> Koalas like Rocket are coming under threat as new roads and most recently a railway line are slicing through the ancient eucalyptus forests they live in. Now a team of conservationists is coming to the rescue of the small koala population that's still clinging on. They have fitted over 200 koalas with sophisticated satellite trackers. It's a pioneering new technique which is having a remarkable impact. This technology allows the team, led by Tosh Tucker, to pinpoint the location of every koala and easily find and capture individuals to monitor their health in a way they never could before. We're gonna go look for Gonzo today. He's, uh, Gonzo. <laughs> yeah, he's one of our little boys in this site. So what am I do? Here's our site here. Wow, and each one of those little blue dots is a koala. Mm, that's right. That is truly incredible. And is it real time? There's a slight lag, but there's every four hours we get a, a transmission. It only takes a few seconds to find Gonzo's name on the map, and he looks dangerously close to the road. So that little spot so there, this is him then, by the looks of it? That's Gonzo, yep. Yeah. And hence this big highway is what we can hear over the back. Exactly, yeah. Once we get an idea of where he is, I'll put his frequency in and we can pinpoint exactly where he is and makes it a lot easier to find. Using a handheld receiver, the team are able to pick up Gonzo's frequency almost immediately and they set off to find him. Sounds like he's just in this patch here. Start looking up? Yep. Ah, there he is, mate. Just look in, the, in that vine near the acacia. 
And he's just sitting in, oh, that, yeah, I got him. in, that, in that fork there. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. With Gonzo located, Tosh calls in his team. The plan is to get Gonzo down to check his radio collar and to give him a thorough health check. All right, B, I'm just going to get down to that lateral. In close-knit koala communities, diseases can quickly spread and wipe out entire groups. Nice and easy. It's vital the team can make sure every koala is in the best health possible if this population is to survive. Grab him, man. All right, Giles. Come in there, mate. Just put him under the bottom there. Hello, little fella. A handful of fresh leaves and Gonzo's ready for his checkup, which each koala gets twice a year. He's loving it. Yeah, it'll calm him right down. He's happy as Larry. Veterinarian Dr. John Hanger has been treating koalas for over 20 years. Back at his surgery, Gonzo is sedated. Give him a once over, hey? First, John checks Gonzo's heart. Sounds good. Next, he checks Gonzo's sharp teeth are all present and correct. Then on to his all important tracker collar. So we just make sure there's plenty of growing space in there because the youngsters are growing rapidly, so we need to make sure that this doesn't get too tight. Then he takes a look at his feet. They're great. Be Blistered. Yeah. That's not normal. No, OK. <laughs> Let's get a photo of that. Gonzo's blistered foot is nothing serious, but even so, John will keep a record of it. Finally, he uses an ultrasound to scan Gonzo's kidneys, stomach and bowel to check he is processing all that eucalyptus properly. So there's the bladder there, the black structure there. Okay, you can see the fermenting parts of the bowel. Eucalyptus is poisonous to many animals and impossible for them to digest. But koalas have a special bacteria in their stomach that can break it down. This movement is a sign that all is well with Gonzo. They really are just leaf processing machines, really. They certainly are. <laughs> He's really starting to wake up. I think we should think about getting him back into that forest. Gonzo's been given a clean bill of health. But John isn't going to return him to just any old tree. Until they are two years old, koalas like Gonzo prefer to be close to their mums. And using the satellite technology again, John can track down Gonzo's mum. We'll just scan down here to find her name. So these are all the koalas with those special collars on. Her name is Jador, and with a click of his mouse, he has found her. OK, so she's hanging around here at the moment. This tells us that the last upload from her collar was five hours ago. So with a bit of luck, she'll still be at that point. Or if she's not there, hopefully she'll be fairly close. But we'll be tracking her with the conventional telemetry gear as well to make sure that... To really hone in on the spot. That's right. This technology, it's incredible, the access that it's given you and the information. Yeah, it's, it's allowing us to monitor the koalas far more uh, intensively than we could have otherwise, and that means that we can intervene much more quickly if they get into trouble. Gonzo has just recovered from his anaesthetic, and the team are off to track down his mum and set him free. Sort of getting this, the strongest signal from... Around this area sort here. Of area. Is that her? A koala in a tree? Well done, Giles. Yep, I think that is there. Yeah, yep. yeah. Right up yep. here. Gonzo's mum is spotted and he's released back to a tree nearby. Gonzo steps out tentatively at first, but he is soon back in the swing of things. Off he goes. He's not hanging around. So far, with the help of this communication technology, the team have helped protect over 400 koalas. The hope is that this technique could one day be rolled out across Australia to help protect the 100,000 koalas who live in the wild.
In British Columbia on the west coast of Canada, this footage caught on camera phone shows a family of killer whales, or orcas. They are one of the ocean's smartest mammals, and this group is behaving in a truly bizarre way. Holy moly. Oh my god. This is crazy. Could these highly unusual orca antics give us new insight into the sophisticated ways that these amazing marine mammals socialize and communicate? This group had come right into the shoreline and appeared to be rubbing their bellies on the pebbles. Marine biologist Jackie Hildering has observed this behavior firsthand. The first time I ever witnessed the behavior it was actually only hearing it and not seeing it. I had an underwater microphone so I could hear the whales communicating back and forth. But also I could hear the rocks then over one another as you had these long skids uh, across uh, the smooth rocks. Jackie's convinced that the orcas were deliberately rubbing their bodies along the pebbles. They'll get down low and scratch every part of their body, skidding across smooth rocks. At first, scientists thought that this was an extreme orca exfoliation, that the killer whales were trying to remove parasites from their skin. But if this was a purely practical habit, you'd expect it would be something all the orcas in these waters would do. In fact, researchers know it's only a few groups of orcas who behave in this way. Why on earth would it be that one population would be rubbing off parasites, half parasites, when the others wouldn't? Oh my God. A breakthrough came from listening to the clicks and squeaks from the orcas, which accompanied this belly rubbing behavior. The sheer intensity of their communication suggested a surprising interpretation. The sounds being made, it is quite something. It's the same sorts of excited calls that they make when family groups meet up with one another. So this had to be social behavior. And it probably feels darn good. My belief is it's a whale massage. It seems that taking time out for a feel-good pebble massage is fun for this family. And what's even more extraordinary is that while we've known for some time that orcas communicate survival skills like how to hunt to their offspring, we now have evidence that just like us, they can communicate their social traditions to the next generation. It's absolutely the case that this behavior is passed on from generation to generation. One of the young killer whales in the footage now has her own calves and is teaching them to beach run. Oh my God. Oh baby. Oh baby. In the much warmer waters of the Atlantic Ocean that surrounds the islands of the Bahamas, new research is giving us fresh insight into another of the ocean's predators, the shark. Zoologist Lucy Cook and Dr. Tristan Guttridge are off the coast of Bimini, heading to a lagoon hidden in the mangrove forests. You just see the little clearing there with yeah. that sand tongue. It's really hidden away. To get there, they have to make their way down a narrow corridor in the mangroves. But researchers recently discovered that young sharks were able to use this lagoon as a safe haven to rest and feed in as they grew up. The roots make it too small for large sharks to fit through. This is it. Yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Gosh, you'd never know it was here, would you? This unique research site 
is showing that instead of being the lone, mindless, mechanistic killers most people think of, sharks could be social, make friendships, and even have personalities. It's not long before the first inquisitive shark comes to investigate. There we go. Nice, beautiful one coming. Really healthy looking sharks in here as well. The sharks here are juvenile lemon sharks, short nosed and stocky. Adults can grow up to three meters long and have powerful jaws. At the moment, they're just patrolling around, they're very calm. They look kind of cautious, actually. To be, to be honest, they look more nervous of me than I am of them. Yeah, absolutely. It was long assumed that sharks, who are generally loners, would only communicate with each other to fight over food or mate. But their behaviour here is suggesting that's not the case. What we found over the years is that they actually follow each other. They, they socialize in this area. So they're not just kind of randomly swimming around solitary. They actually are following each other in groups and they switch groups and change groups over time. And they seem to have actual kind of friends, really, that they prefer to associate with. Wow. But when researchers put food into the water to observe what happened when sharks fed, there were further surprising insights into their behavior. What you'll see is that some will come in sooner than others, and I don't think it's purely because one is hungrier than another one. It's actually one of them will probably take a greater risk than the other one. So you can do that and then wiggle it. Ooh. That's it. Here's one coming in now. Oh, look, they're coming in! <laughs> That's it, and then let them go. This is quite a big one. Pretty soon, they are surrounded by over a dozen sharks. Oh, there's a lot of them around me now. Wait. Woo. Now they're really getting excited. There you go. They do all seem to behave in different ways towards the food. Some really play the tough guy. Oh boy, <laughs> just calm down. Others are a little more shy. You've got him. Hello. Go. <laughs> see him shake his head? Yeah. You can see some of them are less inquisitive than others, some of them come steaming in, mm. and it, I think it's the same with lots of animals, that they have these different personalities. Ooh. Fantastic. Tristan has been putting his observation that sharks might have different personalities to the test. Personality used to be seen as a highly developed trait only found in dogs and primates. Okay, if you want to hop over here, oh, yeah, so I okay. don't want to... So, how will the sharks Hello? fare? Yeah, lovely. To start, they need to transfer the first subject into the test pen. Here you go. Here you go. This test is designed to see if the sharks have different personalities by seeing how they react when an unfamiliar object, a stripy pole, is lowered into the pen. Let the test begin. The first shark almost immediately goes to investigate the new object. And uh, check it out. I it's like that was boldness. Certainly that wasn't scared of it. Wasn't scared yeah. of it. I thought it went in and it came in and it went and checked it out. Before we lowered that, it was circling round the edge. And now it's completely changed its behaviour and it's just doing sort of pass-bys, isn't it? It's totally checking it out. Mm -hmm. It's a bold shark. It's a bold shark. It's time to test the next shark. Will it behave differently? and show it has a different personality? I reckon this one's going to be timid. Timid? Yeah. I'm going bold. You're going bold on this yeah. one. Yeah, I am going bold. The second candidate seems determined to avoid the stripy pole altogether. It's hugging the edge. Yeah, nowhere near as much interest. 
but you can see the difference between the two. That's the cool thing to pick out. Tristan and his team have repeatedly tested over 300 sharks. Each one consistently showed its own unique response to the object. And this suggests, for the first time, that sharks really do have personalities. So this isn't just a freak that it's bold today, but it could be timid tomorrow, that you believe that these are fixed personality types? Absolutely. So if we test this shark next week, it should do the same behaviour, or very similar. Cool. We're only just beginning to understand the complexities of shark communication and interaction, but the team believe that having different personality types actually helps sharks as a species to thrive. They can exploit all the food sources available to them, with some who pick off the easy targets and high rollers who take on the big prey. For sharks, it seems success isn't all about physical perfection. Personality plays a role too. In Florida, in the United States, one of the world's cleverest creatures has learned how to get exactly what it wants by communicating with us. In the small town of Lacanto, Chuck and Alberta Holloway have been receiving strange deliveries. We've got a ballpoint pen. This is a bone, a screw. We don't know what this is. <laughs> We've got a piece of bark, coins, and we have this diamond chip bracelet. Chuck had been putting bird food out on their driveway for almost a year when they first noticed an unfamiliar object amongst the empty peanut shells. I came out to put the feed out, and approximately right along in here was the toy car. And how'd it get here? Strange, <laughs> that's all I can say. Determined to get to the bottom of the mystery, Chuck set up motion-triggered cameras to monitor the scene, and they soon revealed who was leaving the gifts. It was the local crows. Scientists know that crows are smart birds and have the reasoning and problem-solving abilities of a seven-year-old child. When the bird food ran out, Chuck and Alberta's crows would often drop off a gift so far, they've left 57 different items. Studies have shown that crows can recognize and remember individual human faces. And Chuck believes that he might even have received gifts fetched specially for him. This piece is okay. a piece of PVC fitting. And I was working on the sprinklers in the side yard. So I had PVC stuff out there, and all of a sudden it shows up, you know, like... In the feeding tray. Like they were watching, you know, that this is the... Uh, well, you know, he's doing that, so maybe he'd like this. Thanks to the internet, we know this intriguing crow behavior isn't a one-off. People from all around the world have been reporting the same phenomenon. This is my personal favorite. Crow expert Dr. John Withy helps to explain what's going on. And this is when he dropped okay. this thing. Studies have shown that crows also give each other gifts of food and shiny objects. Sometimes it's young crows sharing food with a, a more dominant individual. Sometimes it's between male and females that are paired. But is this more than just a way of saying thank you? From a young age, crows learn that sharing can be rewarding. The expectation is I share food now and I might, you know, receive something from you in the future. Now it seems that crows could actually be capable of entering a kind of trading relationship with humans. We get the gift when the food is empty. 
I'm looking at it that they're bartering, like, I'll give you this if you give us some more food. But it sounds like this association of if we bring something, then the food comes back. And they're certainly capable of that kind of learning. Whether this is a case of crows seeking friendship with humans, or these super smart birds have learnt how to manipulate us into giving them what they want, science is certainly revealing that they have extraordinary powers of persuasion. In this episode, in the jungles of Costa Rica, we discover why sloths are encouraging moths to set up home in their fur. In Australia, we meet a kangaroo that appears to be far happier climbing trees than hopping through the outback. In the Kalahari Desert, we get up close to a fox with hearing so sensitive it can detect insects burrowing deep underground. And we'll reveal the survival secrets of what is quite possibly the world's oddest looking creature. But first, in the French Alps, a remarkable relationship between a man and a white-tailed eagle is for the first time revealing a deeper understanding of the species so that captive-bred eagles can be taught everything they need to know to survive in the wild. From teaching them how to fly in dangerous terrain to teaching them how to catch fish for themselves. This unlikely pairing is not only changing the way we think about birds, but also helping secure the survival of the species from extinction. With a wingspan of almost two and a half meters, the white-tailed eagle is the largest eagle in Europe. These aerial masters are born with impressive anatomy. Their wings are built to soar on thermals. Their eyesight so sharp they can spot prey on the ground with pinpoint accuracy. And to bring home their target, they have powerful talons, capable of a deadly snatch and grab, whether that be with fish or small mammals. Until recently, scientists believed it would be impossible to teach captive-bred eagles enough skills to successfully hunt and survive on their own. But professional falconer Jacques-Olivier Travers is turning that thinking on its head. He's developed a technique that is starting to show signs that it can be done, that captive-bred eagles can be taught to master the secrets of survival. If uh, these birds are trained to fish, trained to fly, they have more chance to survive in the wild. After one or two years, you can have babies in the wild, which is the goal. White-tailed eagles are skilled hunters. But the hunters became the hunted. Seen as a threat to livestock in Britain and as vermin in France, they were wiped out in both countries by the early 20th century. Now the only white-tailed eagles in France are in aviaries or zoos. I discovered this bird in a book. I say, wow, I never see this bird, I want to see one. And I have to wait for a long time, more than 20 years, to see my first one. But when I discover this bird, I fall in love with him. And I, I thought I have to do something for this bird because it disappeared because of us, because we kill all of them. So Jacques Olivier decided he needed to do something. But where do you begin? Well, it may seem obvious, but it's with flying. And for a man to teach an eagle how to fly, Jacques Olivier has to think like an eagle and fly like one, even if that means taking to the air with a paraglider. Flying in captivity is very different to flying in the wild. A bird who is born in captivity knows how to go from point A to point B, but to use the thermal, to use the wind, to use the mount and everything, the paraglider is the best thing. I did many, many big flights from Mont Blanc from, to cross the channel between England and France, uh, in Africa, to prove that my birds fly like a wild one. 
It seems the Eagles not only view Jacques Olivier as their mentor on the ground, but in the air too. They form a strong bond. What is amazing, it's the three, four weeks when he starts to fly, I'm better than him. But <laughs> after one month, they fly so well that I can't follow them. A tiny harness camera on their back gives Jacques Olivier an amazing insight into what it's like to be an eagle. For the first time, you're on the back of a bird, you can feel what he feels. Scientists start to think that, okay, we are right, that we can teach a bird to fly and to hunt, and now they start to support us, and we expect that in one or two years we can do the first real try into the wild to reintroduce adult birds born in captivity that we teach them to fly and to hunt. With the basics of wild flight successfully learnt, Jacques Olivier realized that if he could now just teach his birds how to hunt for fish, the goal of releasing eagles to the wild would be within reach. But that is easier said than done, because eagles learn by imitation, copying how their parents hunt. And it turned out that his captive bred eagles are frightened of the water. At the beginning, I thought, oh, it's a fish eagle, he would like to go on the water. But no, it's scared by the water because he never sees the water in his life. And I had to teach him that it's not dangerous, that he can go, that the prey are in the water. Uh, it's why it's very important to teach them. So Jacques Olivier started with the basics, using safe, unthreatening environments. Small pool, bigger pool, lake, and small piece of fish, real fish, live fish. It's different step. It's a sophisticated movement. He has to control his wings movement, his legs movement, talent movement in the same second. It's very quick. Eventually, the eagles begin to realize what they needed to do in order to get food for themselves. He can catch live fish in a training pool. But the last step will be live fish in a big lake, because when he knows to do that, he don't need me, and he will go back to the wild. Jacques Olivier's unique bond with his birds is vital for preparing the way for a new life in the wild. But to be sure they can cope with any situation, they have one last lesson to learn before they can be set free. Advanced flight. In the toughest part of an eagle's natural habitat, the mountains. Up here, the birds must be able to cope with treacherous strong winds and other extreme weather conditions. We'll join him later in the program when one of his eagles takes on the ultimate flying challenge. Next, 4,000 miles away in Kenya, we're on the trail of something rather more cumbersome. The hippopotamus. Hippos are the largest vegetarians on the planet, capable of munching through 50 kilograms of vegetation a day with relentless machine-like efficiency. It's a lot of food hoovered up by each animal. But scientists have recently discovered that hippos may well give back more to their environment than they take. If ever there was an animal with an image problem, it's these guys. They weigh the same as a family car, but come with the attitude of a 32-ton truck. The hippopotamus is renowned as the most dangerous animal in Africa. Today, conservationist Giles Clark has come to see the work of Dr. Doug McCauley. He's been studying these hippos for the past five years. People talk about hippos as being the most aggressive, most dangerous animals in Africa, but they really feel comfortable in the water. If they don't get in the water, they'll continue just to keep to themselves. But uh, if we come down on a boat right through here, it would be a pretty Different big mess. Different story, right, right, OK. Wow. It's always wise to keep a safe distance from hippos, especially because on land, they can run at 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. There they go, Giles. That's your welcome here to the hippopods. Such an incredible noise. It's communication. 
They're letting each other know that there's something strange here on the riverbank. They're communicating about threat. Right now, you and I, they're, uh, they're a little worried or want to... They've got nothing to worry about with us. <laughs> well, not me anyway. There's an hippo over here doing the yawn display. But those yawns are not about waking up. The yawn-like behavior is designed to show everyone who's boss by displaying those imposing ivory tusks. The tusks are only used for fighting. As vegetarians who graze, the job of grinding up food falls to the huge molars at the back of their mouths. During the day, hippos seemingly do very little. But Doug's research is revealing that this is far from the case. Because while hippos wallow, they're actually playing a vital role in supporting the whole ecosystem. And it's all to do with eating. Hippos prefer to dine alone or in small groups, splitting from the main pod and traveling a short way down the river. There, they leave the water to graze on the food of choice, grass. But to avoid the heat of the strong African sun, their favorite time to dine is after dark. The plan is to observe what they get up to using a newly designed thermal camera that can film with no light. It can detect the heat from an animal's body up to six miles away, and it's something Doug has not been able to try before now. This tool is amazing. One of the reasons why there's just so little known about the hippo is because it's so hard to see them at night. You wouldn't want to be no. traipsing around in that scrubby vegetation at night looking for them. No. Whoa, 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 there, 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 there. Okay. Wow, look at them. Our thermal camera gives some revealing insight into their nighttime activities. Look how it lights up. Yeah. So it almost looks like she's blotchy there. Yeah. It sort of looks like camouflage almost, doesn't it? First time I've seen this in a thermal camera. The blotches are almost certainly thermal windows, flushed areas on the skin that allows them to cool down. Overheating can be a huge problem for hippos, especially when walking on land. But hippos are not the only diners around tonight. And spooked, the hippos demonstrate how quickly they can move when they need to. When things have calmed down an hour later, the camera finally picks up two hippos grazing amongst the trees. So hang on a minute, I think we have a hippos here. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, wow, look. Their 60 centimeter wide mouth gives them an ability to graze in a way that is very different from other herbivores. It's all lips. They're using those big horny lips to grab grass there from the end of the story, rip it as, see, as it, its head goes back yeah, and forth. Yeah, it goes backwards and forwards. Grabbing, plucking and pulling as the hippo sways its head back and forth, cutting that grass down like a, like a putting green in a golf course, right? The hippo's unique way of eating means they can consume huge amounts of grass in one night, five times what a cow would eat. It literally has his head down the whole time. These guys are like vampire lawnmower style. <laughs> so this is the hidden world of a hippo. Here we were just watching him sleep all day. Now, that, now the animals really actually come alive. Yeah. Right? The hippos feed for seven hours straight, and it's what happens next that makes them the unsung heroes of Africa. Because what goes in must come out. And this is what really gets Doug excited. Oh, watch, watch here. Boom! Okay, see that shower of okay. dung? He really showers it. They have a very special way of spreading this dung far and wide. They wag their tails. And the males have a unique adaptation that gives this muck spreading technique even more of a boost. Hippos have a backward facing penis. Probably the weirdest thing about the hippo, right? So this backward penis shoots this spray of urine up and then he's got a loose, globby, gooey bit of dung shooting out of his rear 
all of that gets mixed together with this paddle-like tail and then it splatters everywhere. Doug has discovered that this unique behavior has widespread benefits to the environment. The dung is packed with nutrients that acts as a superfood for all life in and around the river. The dung becomes a really important stimulus of life almost, if you will, into this whole food web. You lock that piece in and the stuff at the bottom begins to sort of work and grow and then you have herbivores that are eating up the algae that grows in the river and then fish eating these herbivores. Next thing you know, you have fish eagles swooping down and catching and eating fish. So, so much of that life sort of springing forth from the back of the hippo. Thanks to Doug's research, we now know that hippos are not just takers. As nature's mobile muck spreaders, they give back, fertilizing the land and the rivers to produce food for fish and for insect larvae that live in the water, all of which in turn will become food for other animals up the food chain. They truly are a life force of Africa's rivers. Next, at Blackpool Zoo in the UK, zoologist Lucy Cook is marveling at another creature who likes to wallow in the water. For years, the public and scientists alike have been impressed at how sea lions are able to perform incredible feats of skill that even humans find it hard to master. But now, thanks to the research being done here by keeper Alex Milne and Dr. Robin Grant, the secrets of their skills are finally being unraveled. Secrets that not only make sea lions superb entertainers, but which also makes them one of the most effective and deadly hunters of the deep. By studying one of the classics of sea lion skills, balancing a ball on the nose, and using the latest high-speed cameras to capture it, it's become clear just how important their whiskers are to perceiving the environment around them. Today, sea lion Anya is demonstrating what she can do. OK, madam, here we go. Catch the ball. Amazing. Well done. Very good. <laughs> Starting to test your catch. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Robin and Alex have discovered that when the ball rolls, it's Anya's whiskers that trigger her head to move. The whiskers always move just before the head moves. So that it's detecting when the ball is about to roll, it moves its whiskers and then it moves its head. How does it translate to their life in the wild? What this is showing you is that the whiskers are basically always one step ahead when it's getting very close to the fish and the fish is trying to evade. They're able to sense very quickly with their whiskers and then change the direction of the body. So what we see with the ball is that it senses it very quickly and then it all responds, which is very similar to how it would detect a fish as well. In the wild, the whiskers detecting the prey would trigger the sea lion's body movement to strike and catch fish, even when hunting at high speed or in near darkness. 180 meters down in the ocean. So this got Dr. Robin thinking. Do they need to see? Could they hunt using just their whiskers alone? To find out, she turned to the ball trick again. On, though this time at night, using special infrared cameras to capture what happens in the dark. OK, are we ready? We're ready. All right, lights off. It had always been thought that sea lions used their whiskers in conjunction with their eyes to successfully hunt. But would this prove otherwise? Here we go. Will she do it? <gasps> She's actually got the ball. I can't believe it. That's amazing. Incredibly, Anya is able to balance the ball just as she did in the daylight. She can't see a thing, can she? She has to be doing that just with her whiskers. Yes, she does. They're using their whiskers as their primary sense, so they'll be using them like we would use our eyes whenever they're in the dark and underwater. 
It's a super sense, a great skill to have, and why she's such a fantastic marine predator. That's it. This simple infrared experiment has shown for the first time that sea lions' efficient hunting skills are all down to the smallest of anatomical adaptations, their whiskers. Next, in South Africa, a group of researchers are on the hunt. They are trying to discover the nocturnal secrets of a rather elusive creature. Biologist Patrick Ayi is joining them to find out more. This is the Kalahari Desert, 700,000 square kilometers of semi-arid savanna. With little water and an extreme climate, the animals that live here have had to evolve unique physical adaptations in order to survive. Eliza LaRue and Matthew Patel are here to study the bat-eared fox. Bat-eared foxes are extremely timid and difficult to get close to. They only emerge from their underground burrows at night. But Eliza and Matt have found a way to win their trust using bribery. Oh, there he is, look. Over the last 18 months, the team have managed to build a relationship with the foxes by offering raisins as gifts. This fox is right here, right in front of us. Being able to get this close to a fox is helping Matt and Eliza finally understand the secrets of their survival. Isn't he just wonderful? I kind of feel like a statue right now. I don't want to move. You can move, but move very slowly. OK. How are you? And this is the first time that people have been able to get this close to these animals on foot. It really is quite a special moment. Yeah. Hello. This is just brilliant. One of the adaptations that helps bat-eared foxes to survive here is hard to miss. It's their gigantic ears. They use their ears to hunt in the dark. And given their favorite prey are termites, which are only about one centimeter long and are completely silent to most animals, it's an astonishing capability. You see how he had his head up like that? He's actually listening for the noise of termites. See, he's just listening. The bat-eared fox's ears are so sensitive, they can pick up the faint crunching of termites chewing on dry grass. Their ears act like satellite dishes and can rotate independently to gather in and amplify sounds. We know that they can pick up the termite sound and that they can actually pinpoint those locations from 50 meters away, at least. Incredible. See how I just sucked him right up? Yeah, his head's just twitching. Researchers have found that their hearing is so sensitive they can easily detect burrowing termites several feet underground. How many termites do you reckon they can get through in a night? Oh, wow, uh, thousands, thousands of termites. God. And they can go from patch to patch and just spend 15, 20 minutes in an area gobbling them up. But to be successful in the desert, bat-eared foxes need more than just termites on the menu. They supplement their diet with insects, grubs, and even small mammals. Finding a range of food in a harsh environment like this is no easy task. So scientists believe they need to be natural problem solvers in order to survive here. It's something Matt and Eliza have been able to put to the test and filmed some remarkable nocturnal behavior. There is the puzzle box. The puzzle box contains some raisins, but to get to them, the fox has to pull a rope or push a lever. To the right, you can see where the rope sticks out, where they can pull on the string, and the lever is on the left. They could potentially push. Okay. There we go, there's a fox right here. Here it comes, yep. The fox isn't scared by the unfamiliar object. When foraging for scarce food in the desert, it pays to always be inquisitive. 
It can smell the food, and this is an opportunity that can't be missed. Straight away, he's sniffing and smelling the box. Yeah, he knows yeah. something's going on. Quite a few raisins in there. But will it solve the problem of how to get at them? Yep, so, up, up. yeah, he's got, oh, brilliant. So that took him about, what, 20 <laughs> seconds to hit the first lever. Yes. And now he's going the opposite direction. Ah, he's at it. That is brilliant. The clever candidate refused to be outfoxed, and in well under a minute, he works out how to get his reward. <laughs> there we go. Brilliant. That's awesome. Elisa and her team have tested 10 bat-eared foxes. A remarkable 80% of them managed to solve the problem. So far, it looks like they show improvement over time. So there is some sort of learning curve happening. The foxes are getting faster at getting to the raisins, which is evidence of intelligent, learned behavior, supporting Matt and Elisa's theory that there's more to these creatures than just an incredible set of ears. It's also what's between those ears that seems to be the secret to their survival. Next, we're on the other side of the world, in Australia. It's a continent not unknown for its unique and rather strange animals. And none are stranger than perhaps the macropods, such as kangaroos and wallabies, both of which developed large feet, strong, long tails, and an ability to hop huge distances through the outback. But head into the lush Australian rainforest, and you might be surprised to discover there is a kangaroo that has evolved to live in trees. It's known as the tree kangaroo. Today, conservationist Giles Clark is meeting Margaret Cianelli. She spends her time raising orphan tree kangaroos to help them get back into the wild. Was that her? It could have been. We're about to meet Kimberly. I saw a tail then. Yeah, yeah. Margaret is a former zookeeper and over the years as a surrogate mum has successfully released 15 tree kangaroos back into the wild. Oh, wow. Hello, Serena. So this is Kimberly. Yeah, isn't she gorgeous? I think she's coming down. She's heard you. Kimberly has lived in Margaret's house for over two years. Good girl. And she's learnt how to use her paws to help her slide down a tree. Tail first just like a wild tree kangaroo. Good girl, Kimberly. Oh. Look, this is Charles. Hello. Isn't she good? Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> Almost home. Walking home with a kangaroo on your head is just an everyday experience for Margaret. And so it seems, is sitting down to have tea with one. Just so surreal. Completely normal, I'm sure, for you, but this is definitely not a typical evening. <laughs> Kimberly is just two and a half years old. In the wild, she would stay with her mother until around the age of three, the longest in the kangaroo family. So while she spends her days in the forest, she still prefers to spend her nights with her surrogate mum. What's her story? How did she end up in your care? She actually fell into a local swimming hole oh. out of a tree and obviously would have drowned. I mean, she was only seven months old. All attempts to reunite Kimberly with her mother failed. So Margaret took on the job. This is a good exercise. She would need to help Kimberly build up her muscles if she was to get back into the trees. Once she'd mastered the basics inside the house, Margaret let her loose on her own handmade jungle gym. Margaret has also been teaching Kimberly what to eat. You get new green soup in a minute. Maybe Charles can give you your green soup. 
This green soup is Kimberly's favorite and provides her with extra fluid and nutrients. Doesn't look like my idea of delicious, but... <laughs> she likes it that way. Next, she has to learn what the leaves she will need to eat in the wild look and smell like. You're just an eating machine, aren't you? And when she's fed, it's time to hop up to bed. Alrighty, good night. Sleep See you well later then. In the morning. Good night. A tree kangaroo's sleep pattern is very different to ours. In the wild, their low calorie diet means they eat little and often. So they only sleep in short bursts of up to an hour at a time. And that makes getting a good night's rest not that easy for Margit. Hello. Hello, Missy. <laughs> good morning. I'm just fascinated in the way in which she gets around. It's this sort of half walk, half hop. When she hops, the tail never touches the ground. See how she... <laughs> Unlike her ground-dwelling kangaroo cousins who can only hop, tree kangaroos can move their legs independently. It gives them greater mobility. But Margit wants Kimberly to spend less time walking on her kitchen floor and more time climbing up in the trees. Good girl. Today, a tiny, lightweight camera is being attached to Kimberly's tracking collar. OK. This will give an opportunity to see the world from Kimberly's perspective, and importantly for Margit, to see if she has what it takes to survive in the Thank wild. You. OK, we better go. Off the ground, it becomes clear just how agile Kimberly really is. Oh. Oh. She's perfectly adapted to life in the trees. I'm mesmerized. Just how quickly she got up the tree. She knows how to distribute her weight. Six and a half kilos, and she's just standing literally on twigs. Yeah, look at her balancing. It's extraordinary. <laughs> But she's definitely at home in the tree. She knows where she wants to go. To reach the tastiest leaves at the top of the tree, Kimberly will have to climb the height of a six-storey building. It's way beyond what can be seen from ground level. We all got to have a look. Reviewing the camera footage later that night reveals the surprising secrets of Kimberly's abilities. how high she is. Yeah. Almost makes me dizzy when she looks down. Yeah. Right up in the canopy. Her speed along branches is so impressive compared to her awkward movements on the ground. Oh man, she moves around so quick. I must say, I'm a bit surprised by that. She's more active than I... Than you anticipated? Yeah. Oh. Kimberly was up in the trees for almost 10 hours, during which time she more than proved she was ready for life in the wild. You can see that she's eating here. <laughs> you can hear it. It's just amazing. And she's so fussy. She picks and sniffs lots of them, but only eats certain ones. It takes Margaret around two years to teach her orphans all the skills they need to survive. But for Kimberly, her days at school are nearly over. You can't help but feel she's nearly there. It shouldn't be too much longer, and she'd be making that choice to stay out. I'm going to stay out tonight, Mum. Yes, and I'm ready for it. I am proud of her. I love her, and she can do it all, even though she didn't have a real mum. Oh, she's got a real mum. <laughs> you just don't have a big tail. <laughs> Thanks. Next. We're still in Australia, but 2,000 miles south on the Yarra River, just outside Melbourne. Marine biologist Shanta Bali is joining ecologist Josh Griffiths in search of a very strange animal. An animal so unusual that when reports of its anatomy first emerged around 200 years ago, many were convinced it was a hoax. 
described back then as a duck that was part beaver and which laid eggs, it's not hard to see why. They're here to find the duck-billed platypus. If you want to knock one of those it's difficult to, the to see them by day. They prefer to hunt at night. So Josh sets traps and will wait for nightfall in order to study them more closely. Josh has been researching platypus here for the past six years and is discovering just how perfectly adapted they are to hunt and survive in these creeks. If you had a good look at the rocks, you'd probably see some of the, the things that platypus are eating. Some of the insect larvae, small crustaceans, worms, and that's what they're looking for, little invertebrates like that. Platypus need to eat a third of their body weight in food every single night. That's an awful lot of larvae and worms to find in the dark. With the net in place, all they need to do now is wait. Surprisingly, platypus managed to find food in the dark in a very similar way to how sharks detect and hunt for their food. We know that they can detect the electrical impulses of animals moving underwater. So they, those tiny little insects that we saw this afternoon, their muscle contractions creates a minute electrical impulse. It must be absolutely tiny. It, it's tiny. It's something that a lot of our really sensitive equipment can't even pick up. After waiting for six hours, finally the net moves. We got anything? I'll tell you what. We got something? I'll tell you what. There he is. Most amazing thing. He's holding on, isn't he? Yeah, they're really strong little creatures. And that is a little male. We finally got one. Josh quickly puts the platypus in a bag to make it feel safer. It helps calm it down and stops it from becoming stressed. Its size, weight and general health are recorded to monitor the population. It's also a unique opportunity to take a close look at its remarkable bill, which can detect electrical signals and which allows it to hunt so effectively. So he's just poked his bill out oh, of the, wow. the hole in the bag. Can I touch it? Yeah, it's, it's very different to what people expect. Oh my gosh. It's not hard like a duck's bill, it's actually quite soft to touch. Wow, it's so soft. You can see the little pores that are all through the bill. They're very fine. There's thousands of them yeah. across the bill. Around 40,000 tiny bumps speckle the bill. These are the receptors that detect minute electrical currents. Equipped with these, the platypus can pick out a single worm wriggling on a rock in a pitch black river. Astonishingly, when compared to the hammerhead shark, the platypus has more than 10 times as many electrical receptors. Okay. With Josh's checkup complete, it's time to return this supreme hunter back to the river. Let's let him get back to doing what he does best. Yeah. It's intriguing to see the bill of a wild platypus close up. But to see it in action, Shanta heads to observe a platypus in a much more controlled environment. Melbourne's Healesville Sanctuary is a haven for threatened Australian species, and it's also home to a female platypus called Yamakuna. So acrobatic. It's feeding time. On the menu today are bloodworms. Although only a few centimetres long and extremely thin, as with any living creature, the bloodworms are emitting tiny electrical signals. When Yamakuna detects those signals with her bill, she goes into hunting mode and without using her eyes or her hearing, lets her bill guide her to the prey. As Yamakuna swings her head from side to side, it's as though she's casting a 3D invisible net which picks up the electrical signals from the worms. Her bill is also detecting minuscule pressure waves produced by the wriggling. And as the intensity of those signals increases, Yamakuna knows exactly how close the worms are. A few minutes is all it takes to track, locate, and eat hundreds of worms. The comparison with sharks is fascinating. 
Both can detect electrical signals and pressure waves. But where a shark also uses vision to home in on its prey, the platypus can hunt in total darkness using only the receptors on its bill. How surprising then, an animal early explorers thought was part duck, part beaver, is actually one of the most technically advanced hunters on the planet. On the other side of the world, in the rainforests of Costa Rica, another remarkable creature has found a very clever way to ensure its survival by using camouflage. It's the sloth. Sloths are one of the most abundant mammals here, but they are not easy to spot. Today, zoologist Lucy Cook is joining a team of researchers who thankfully know how to find them. Professors John Pawley and Zach Peary have been carrying out one of the biggest studies ever made of this little-known creature, looking at the extraordinary adaptations that allow sloths to thrive in this environment. On this, oh, there. That is so cool. Literally lying in a tree having a nap, just like a sloth should be. He's not in a hurry. He walks a little way, he takes a rest, he walks a bit more. By taking their time to go about their business, they burn fewer calories than any other mammal of similar size. The amount of energy a sloth needs to live on a day is really, really low. It's about 140 kilocalories per day. Wow, that's like the same as a packet of crisps. That's like nothing. The leaves that sloths prefer to eat have very little nutritional value. So by conserving energy, they are able to survive on tiny amounts of food each day. But being slow does have its downside. It makes them hugely vulnerable to predators, like jungle cats and aerial hunters, like the harpy eagle. So these sloths have developed a clever use of camouflage. It's coming down to see us. The sloth is green because it's covered in algae and perfectly matches its surrounding environment. Hello, mister. It's a male. Oh, wow. Have you given this one a name? Uh, 992 is the number of his radio. Really? But we, we don't have a name for him. What about Cyril? Cyril works. Yeah. You want to hold him? Yeah. Wow. Not only is Cyril Fantastic. covered in algae, but on closer inspection, there are hundreds of tiny moths that he allows to live in his fur. These moths are only found in sloths. They're found nowhere else. Uh, they depend entirely on the sloth for their entire existence. For a long time, it was assumed that it was only the moths that benefited from this arrangement. But John and Zach's research is finding this is definitely a two-way street. When these moths die, they actually fertilize the fur within the sloth, and they create nitrogen that helps the algae that you see on their fur to grow. The moths themselves are making compost. That's right. That helps keep the sloth green. That's exactly right. The more moths that live on a sloth, the greener and more camouflaged it will become. This clever relationship means that sloths don't have to outrun predators. They simply disappear. Next, we're back in France, following the extraordinary story of how a bird that was eradicated from the country over a hundred years ago is on the verge of being reintroduced. Professional falconer Jacques-Olivier Travers is the man behind that plan. Through his special relationship with white-tailed eagles, he's managed to develop a technique that is hoped will allow captive-bred eagles to be released and to survive in the wild. 
The technique requires nine months of one-on-one -on -one training. First, he teaches the eagles the basics of wild flying over difficult terrains. Then, how to hunt for themselves. But before the eagles are considered ready for release, the birds must pass one last test. Flying in difficult weather conditions, high in the mountainous ski resort of Morzine. Jacques Olivier is taking his latest pupil up to 1,500 meters for the final test. It's on the upper extreme of an eagle's natural habitat. But if a bird that has been hand-raised can fly here, it can fly anywhere. When you are in mountain during winter, it's a bad environment because the wind comes down the mountains and push the eagle in the valley. He can't fly very well. He has to do big effort to stay in the mountain to control his flight. And it's one of the most difficult exercises that I can do with a bird. But when he's able to do that, it means that he flies like a wild one. This eagle is trained to fly to Jacques Olivier on command. But up here, with high crosswinds and the added challenge of having to avoid the potentially fatal overhead cables, the stakes are high. Up, up. The eagle launches its four kilogram body into the air. Using its sheer power and primary flight feathers at the tips of the wings to become airborne. As you can see, the wind is bad. It's difficult for him to stay. You, you see, you can see that he flies so slowly because the wind is bad, you have to control his flight. No, it's good, it's good. The rapid descent is the toughest challenge yet. Air currents become unstable the closer it gets to the ground. These conditions are exactly like those the eagles will have to master if they're ever able to catch prey on their own. Yeah, he's coming back now, it's perfect. Up, Victor, up! Even in these blustery conditions, the eagle is able to slow himself down from a 60 mile per hour dive to land precisely on Jacques Olivier's hand. Hey. Victor! Nice work, because today, as you can see, it's not very good weather condition for flying. At the top of the mountain, the wind was bad. He was pushing down, but he, he worked hard to turn in bad weather condition. Follow us. Now it's ready to go into the wild, for sure. Introducing captive bred animals to the wild successfully is one of the hardest things to do in wildlife conservation. But through the dedication of one man and his extraordinary relationship and understanding of his birds, the white-tailed eagle could soon, once again, be flying free in the French Alps. <laughs>